Well, it is, and well, it's interesting, like how it changed. Some of the readings were like, you know, she writes so much about like parenthood and stuff like that that I was kind of particularly daughters she doesn't write so much about the sons i guess does she only have daughters yeah, or... yeah she had two daughters it's interesting though because i think that um later on it was um, interesting because i think also going through this made me realize how much i've not i don't think i've read her really chronologically before i think that this is because it's such a tome i think that a lot of my reading of it was just like flip to a random page and figure out what i want there is one poem of hers where she talks about wishing she had a son called Menstruation at 40, which I think is in Live or Die. But I think that that's all about like this hypothetical son. And I think that's the only time it really comes up. Yeah, I always yeah. love that too. And I think it's so important. Like I, I say this all the time, but it's so important to read chronologically, especially you can really only do that when it's writers like dead too, because then you have like everything they've ever written in order in yeah. like a big tome like this. And it just you see the, the differences and the changes and then the similarities like the thematic differences everything that happens when you're i don't know i mean doing all that like like just reading something from start to finish like this was her very first book this was her very last book and then in this case it's even like yeah posthumous stuff i mean it's more educational than almost any other way to like read like a complete works you know like yeah. You know what? That's what um, Elizabeth Bishop's. I think that I took a class in university on Elizabeth Bishop, and I think that the one bit of advice I think was literally to find one poet, and I think for her it was George Herbert, the metaphysical, to just read through start to finish everything that they've done. I think that that sort of as advice or as a way of reading is really not something that people do anymore. I mean, I think that also, I guess, a lot of it is because. I guess there are obviously complete poems, but I think that we, we really live in the era of like the selected poems, the greatest hits album. So I think that, uh -huh. uh, that's, and I just think, yeah, I don't think it's something that I think a lot of people don't just read from, I think it's interesting, especially with someone like Sexton where, well, I'll just get into what I want to say. So I don't want to say too much, but I think that you see how much she learns to write or does new things as you read her chronologically, because I think that she wasn't, classically trained as much as the sort of other poets around at the time. And I think that you can see her sort of, I think that you can actually really see a development almost from a sort of teenage poet into sort of different eras of poets. So I think that that's kind of interesting. Absolutely. Heavy. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Bored. Uh, welcome back to another episode of Heavy Board, and you are hearing Sarah Fletcher, who is back here to discuss the uh, complete works of Anne Sexton. Sarah, welcome back to Heavy Board. Andrew, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. I have to say, I think last time I was here, I had the most fun online that <laughs> was in a way that I could. But I had the most fun online in a way that I could like tell my mom and dad about. <laughs> so I think you should. Think. <laughs> so I think that. Um, I am, um, and I think that now in my mind, gossip um, podcasts are a place where it's like, talk about literature and then like veer into gossip. I think that they're actually quite a good um, medium for that sort of mix. So I think that I actually, I thought it was wonderful. And I was really pleased when you kind of, yeah, suggested that we kind of focus in on Sexton because I think that looking back on this has really shown me how much, again, she's been a kind of perennial poet who I've gone back to. And I feel like I've actually, because she's a bit, embarrassing to like and I think also she's a bit um I think done down by the fact that she's so often compared to Sylvia Plath and I think that she's almost kind of overshadowed by her comparisons but I think I've often taken the role of sexton defender a lot so I'm ready to uh take my kind of rhetorical sword in her honor for this um project as well absolutely that's why we had to have Sarah back on here uh so soon listeners because she's the uh ultimate sexton expert at least the one that I know 
How's uh, how's your book doing anyway? We should mention that. Let's plug your book too. Author of Plus Ultra, her debut poetry collection. Oh, it's turning one years old, which is exciting. So I think that it's coming up to the anniversary. Well, I'm not sure. Is it an anniversary or is it more of a birthday? I feel like I'm leaning towards anniversary, but I think that that's been exciting. I have some new readings coming up. And yeah, I think that, um, again, I was kind of thinking about when people, I, I think you're often asked kind of who influences you on your poetry. And I think that plus ultra is something where I think obviously it is tr it, one, this is true, but also in a bit way, it just seems smart. I think that Anne Sexton would not be one of the first people who I'd mention as a top influence. I think that I usually go for some kind of heady mix of like, well, Frederick Seidel and like the metaphysicals and like also William Blake or something like that. But I do think that there is a kind of strong Sexton element throughout it. Um, I think that with, um, and Sexton, I think that she she herself had a sort of weird relationship with the like term confessional. And I think that in some ways, um, I don't even know if I would necessarily call her a confessional poet, because I feel like having confessional requires you to have an element of shame. And she's pretty <laughs> shameless. I don't feel like she's I think that she um, I, I, I think that she's actually like I don't think that she feels bad or that embarrassed about what she's writing about. And I think that there's a sort of flagrancy and how blatant she is that I think in some ways kind of goes against what we see as confessional. And I think that that's a sort of um, flirtatiousness or even vulgarity that I feel like has been a kind of inspiration on Plus Ultra. So if you're intrigued by that, you should definitely buy my book, invite me on podcast, photo shoots, anything <laughs> <I'm> available. <laughs> and that's linked below listeners, of course. Uh, so buy a copy, click the link and buy a copy. Yeah, and I think for Sexton, it's interesting that you say that because Sexton is like, yeah, there, there's, there's obviously there's confessional elements, so it's easy to group her into that, but it's only a few things, and I know we'll get into this as we get deep into the podcast. It's like, so obviously her parents' death, and then like her mm -hmm. like longing to kill herself, and the institutionalization of like being in like mental hospitals and shit from those suicide attempts. It's like those three things are really like the big elements of confession. And then other than that, I, I honestly, there are even parts where I noticed like kind of like Emily Dickinson stuff, like kind of, she seemed to be really into that. Um, and then obviously I knew from the introduction, which we're going to get to like the fairy tale she was obsessed with kind of fairy yes. tale elements. Yeah. Uh, I think that to Bedlam and part way back, which is her first collection. I think that also rereading that, is that there's actually also a significant amount of kind of dramatic monologues. I think, I don't know if this poem is in her first um, collection or her second one, but I think that there's a poem called To the Unknown Girl in the Maternity Ward, yeah. which I really like. And I think that um, she, in an interview, I think would express frustration at this idea that people were like, did you have a baby at 16 and left it? And she's like, no, <laughs> but like, I guess because I'm the sort of poet that I am, people have this kind of assumption that everything that I write is about my life. And in some ways, of course, you, can you blame the interviewer when she's using the real name of someone and talking about a very real hospitalization, right. like in a poem that's next to that. So I think that it's a sort of um, intriguing mix. I actually have a uh, funny story where I went to Boston with my ex-boyfriend and we I, I ended up messaging this academic I can talk. I can talk a bit of shit about him, so it's fine, I think. But I think that he um, is a he's a Plath scholar, and me and my ex boyfriend asked him if we could go on a sort of like Sexton Plath excursion around Boston, and he was very excited to do that. But it was so funny because we went to um, damn it, what's the name? Um, McLean, the big mental hospital, which is a working mental hospital. They just happened to stay there. But it was very much like the, the academic was like, look, those are real crazy people. And I'm like, <laughs> what? like, I don't know. I feel kind of bad. We're like on the grounds of a private hospital. He asked if I wanted to have um, a photo taken in front of the garage where Sexton killed herself. And I think I was like, I don't know. Like, do I look happy or sad in this photo? I don't really know if a photo is appropriate. And he said something funny where he's like, we have to park the car up the road because the people who live there now recognize my car. <laughs> I'm like, how often are you rocking up to this like suicide spot? That's insane. He's like walking up there uh, and masturbating in his car or whatever. <laughs> no, well, this is the funny thing. So I think that there's definitely, well, I, I asked him, I was like, so, and again, at this point, I'm being totally like academic with it. I was like, so like, 
which, um, who do you prefer, Sexton or Plath, in terms of like, well, I, I thought it was implicit in terms of their poetry. He is a man of kind of stout stature. I would say he is perhaps more on the manlet side. And he just looked <laughs> really into the distance and said, well, Plath hated short men. <laughs> so I guess I choose Sexton because I'd have a better chance of getting laid because <laughs> she was a bit promiscuous. And I yeah. was like, what dude? This is like, this is hilarious. Sure. Um, I just, and we, and we saw her grave as well, but I just thought it was the funniest thing because I think that the first, actually, this, well, this ties well into the first poem of To Bedlam and Partway Back, You, Dr. Martin, which I actually love. Um, he got me to read it at the, at the entrance of the asylum, which again is like a working asylum where there are people who are like patients who like definitely the last thing they want is like a literature, like, like one art hoe and a disgruntled boyfriend and this weird old professor <laughs> to be like reading poetry in front of where they're there to like, I don't know, adjust bipolar medication. <laughs> um, I think, and I just, uh, I mean, and it was, it was beautiful, but I think that, um, yeah, I think that that actually is it's so funny because I think that with To Bedlam and Partway Back, I think that the first poem, even though it has a weird center justification going on, I think it's one of my favorites. Um, and I think that it's one of the ones that I think is actually, I think this, um, I think with love, I think a lot of the uh, quality varies a lot with the first book. And I think that um, that one, I just think what a way to start your kind of debut, which is you, Dr. Martin, walk from breakfast to madness, I think is so good. <laughs> yeah, and it's um, interesting also... how like these, these, especially Sexton and Plath, you know, like uh, not to tie it into like kind of present day with this, the literary mm -hmm. it girls, right? Like these kind yeah. of this term that's been thrown around the last year or so or more, because uh, there was that article written, uh, I, I can't even remember it, but it was, uh, it feels like a year ago now, but it was, just that they were the archetypes, like Plath and Sexton were the kind of ar archetypes for this hot, kind of sad girl, kind of, and all, I mean, really talented as well, but just like this kind of like archetype that people, and we'll get into this, like try to copy, want to be, you know, almost, I mean, this is true, you know, you could find male examples of this too, right? Like the kind of Bukowski style alcoholics that, you know, womanizer, whatever, like this kind of I don't give a fuck type yeah. archetypes. But like, it's just interesting that that was... Because, I, I mean, you could always think about it, but I just think of, like, the, the, the poets, and especially the female poets previ before them, you know, were never considered that kind of, like, yeah. hot it girl, like, thing. Like, it was always, like, a stuffy, like, Elizabeth Bishop, like, you know. I think Edna St. Vincent Millay was pretty hot. And I think yeah, kind yeah, of I guess, sassy. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. She's, but, I think, but I think I know what you mean. And what I find frustrating mm -hmm. about that as a sort of... Um, weird way, I feel like I'd even say the phrase been co-opted, is that Plath, I think, was pretty, if you read her diaries, she was pretty much a kind of type A. She was more of an introvert. She was actually quite type A and perfectionist. I think that, I think Sexton was the one who would be fun to party with and was the one flirting with everybody. But I think that Sexton was, I, I mean, I think Plath was monogamous to Ted Hughes. And I think mostly we forget that she had children at like 24, 23 and then spent most of her kind of time being a mom. So she kind of, you know, had a slut phase in college, I guess. But I think that this idea of Plath is this sort of like, that she would be wearing red lipstick and be on Tumblr talking about her feelings oh. is really not what I actually get from her. I feel like she would be wanting to go home early. Um, Sexton, I think, meanwhile, um, really revels in the extra. I know that when she and Plath actually went to, um, they went to the same writing workshop together. And I think that um, they it was a kind of famous story that I think um, a lot of people know now, where I think that they, after the workshop, would get, um, they would go to the Ritz and have three martinis and like talk about how they both have tried to kill themselves. And then there's this other poet, I think his name's John Starbuck, who was there with them, just being like, damn, am I like scared or turned on? <laughs> I'm like so confused as to what's <laughs> happening now. Um, I know that. Um, where was it like, uh, Anne Sexton, I think would drive. Um, and I think she would park her car in a zone that said total zone because she, she would be like, cause we're getting totaled. So I think that she was definitely the like, I think literary it girl, party girl in terms of that sort of how we have that sort of feminine stereotype of that. Um, the poet is a kind of seductress. I think that she actually really lent into that 
pretty flagrantly in a way that I don't think that Plath did as much. Um, I think Sexton would also famously start, I think every reading up until when she died with the poem, Her Kind. And I think that, which is obviously one of her most famous ones, but I think she'd introduce it with, this is a poem that will tell you first what kind of poet I am and two, what kind of woman I am. And if you don't like it, you can leave, which is like, whoa, what a way to start a reading and to keep that kind of consistent through your whole career. So I think that, um, yeah, it is interesting that I think that the I think that their friendship I think has definitely sort of I think um, sparked this sort of again I grew up on Tumblr being a sort of I think that's just I think it's like that very specific millennial thing. I'm teaching a um, a Gen Z student now. She's just turned 21 and she's great. But I think I re- it's the first time that I feel like I've ever kind of felt old with things or realizing <laughs> that you kind of experience growing up online was very different than other people's and of course it would be different than hers but I think that I was trying to be like well you know the Lana Del Rey Sylvia Plath tumblers and like you know they were always kind of weirdly mixed with like like it'd be fine but then you'd accidentally see porn or like you'd accidentally see eating disorder stuff but it was like mostly that sort of like aesthetic and I was like that was like just the common thing being a girl online when you're 15 and she was like what are you talking about (laughs) so yeah I mean that that how fast things do shift from generation to generation now. Whereas even until like up until like 10 years ago, most, I mean, they obviously our generation with millennials, there was like internet change things, but like you could still experience almost similar things to stuff that Sexton and Plath and all those others were like doing as they grew up in their adolescence. And, uh, and now it's just like such a 180 compared to, the, the generations that are post social media life, like era, it's really is insane. Yeah, it is really interesting to think about, I guess what we kind of see as common pivotal growing up experiences somehow being very shifted. Um, I saw something earlier this week that said something that was like, I think that often when we kind of try to teach like history things, I think that we'd like to be like, well, look, the ancient Greeks are interesting in this way they thought like us, or even like um, the romantics were thinking like us in this way. What I think is actually the most interesting, though, is how they would not have been thinking like us, or they would have had incredibly different perceptions of the world, the same questions that we have, and even just same kind of cognitive ways of going through a problem would be entirely different. And I think that that's the sort of, I think, um, massive contrast that we'll see, I think, with new generations. I mean, I think that there will be a sort of, privileged gosh now i'm getting into like political opinions which is like the worst thing to do when i've not even finished my drink but um i think that it's kind of interesting because i do think that we'll get to a phase where i think that being able to kind of think without the age of sort of um a screen i think almost in itself will be a kind of sign of upper classness or privilege like i think that who is kind of like i think a lot of with students i can easily tell who's submitting something that they've worked on and written themselves versus who's kind of, even if they've not got chat GBT to write it, definitely used elements of that. And I think it's interesting because I feel like before, what I always say to students is, I don't actually care so much what you're arguing, but I really just care how you got to these things and what you want it, like your own insights on it. And I think that that's something where, yeah, I think that the sort of exploratory side of learning or learning as a process instead of an answer that we're kind of, almost augmenting ourselves in this transhumanist way to get to that. I think it's quite anti-ethical to creativity as well as knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. That's yeah. It's changing so much. I even see, like I was looking into like these, like the best selling books on Amazon and stuff. Like they're these kind of AI created books, you know, obviously like the big presses and stuff still publish and market their stuff through Amazon and all, but like, these it'll be like something dumb like like a hundred interesting facts or something about whatever some bullshit and that's like a bestseller that gets recommended on page one if you just search for like books and stuff and if you look at the interior like it's like ai created and it was probably edited by somebody but it was just like oh my god it's like something uh, i think that is quite dystopian also i think my friend and i we play a game together where I think that actually AI does not really understand what makes a fact interesting. 
So we'll both choose a random topic like ferrets or something like that and be like, tell us more 10 interesting facts about ferrets. And then we'll be like, those aren't interesting. Make them more interesting. And we took challenge the AI to see how much, what is, what is their level of the most interesting of facts? Because they obviously want to please them. Like, those facts are boring. Give me more, like, how can they be more interesting? And I think that it is very weird. I'm like, well, I don't care that ferrets only live three years. That's not an interesting fact about them. Or I don't know how long they live. I don't actually care about ferrets. Right. Um, but I think that, um, yeah, it is very weird in what it's kind of able to replicate or not. And I do think, uh, I don't know. I think I've honestly been lucky this term that I think that my student is, she's, Super, super. I think that she's great because I think that she almost embarrassingly in a first session was kind of like, yeah, you know what I'm kind of interested in? Like rhyme and meter. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, we're going to have amazing. This is great. I did not expect you to say that. I really did not. Like, I was like, I did not see that coming. Awesome. We're going to read so much Milton. We're going to be going hard on the romantics. I like made her write a million sonnets. So I think that she's, um, I'm pretty lucky with that, but I do think that there's a sort of, um, yeah, I think thinking of, um, I think kind of go, it's funny though, because AI can only really write in form. I often try to ask it for unrhymed poems and it doesn't know how to not rhyme a poem. So yeah, spooky. It's almost like retarded to the way it operates. Like it's it, the large language models, like, it doesn't remember what it wrote previously past 3000 words or something. So if you're having it write like long form things, it just starts repeating itself. And, and it, it's like, it's that one thing. Like I think when everybody's like, Oh, what's the difference between a computer and a human? I'm like, well, that is right there. Like the computer. Started to. Yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah. But I just, I mean, in terms of like creation. Yeah, it's like choose choose the way in which your retardation kind of segments itself. Yeah. <laughs> so we're just like at the, least we have like object uh, permanence. Yeah, so. and we can. That's what makes it art, right? Is is the is our ability to not just remember what we wrote, you know, forty thousand words previously, but also like to be able to tailor it and to make it something like beautiful, like like. I don't know. I mean, that's the difference, right? Like when it comes to creativity is like there, there's computers can create things. Sure. But like to make something good, like it's, I mean, maybe it'll be there eventually. Everyone always claims. And then what they do is like for art, like visual arts and stuff. But like, even then, like it doesn't quite recognize because again, it's not a thinking kind of brain. What makes a visual piece stand out from like a different one, you know, like from, yeah. Like a meme. I think also because I think it doesn't understand. I think I guess the way I don't know. Like, I mean, I think we spoke about Harold Bloom last time, and I think I'm a big, um, huge anxiety of influence fan in general. Like Bloom, Bloom girl in general. Gosh, imagine if he knew that people were around calling themselves Bloom girls. But I think uh, a bloomer. So, uh -huh. um, but anyway, so I think that I. Um, but I do think that part of what I think he has kind of argued, which I think makes sense, is that there is almost a sort of dialectical relationship between how influence happens. And it's very cool if I look at a sort of, I don't know, if I look at a certain painting that you can kind of see the sort of lineage of thought and reference that was happening before that. And I think that with AI, it's really just a flat circle that they're drawing from. I think that they're really like this idea of how influence works or like you're not replicating something or like what makes the painting special is actually how like, these different influences are combining. I think that there's this kind of wider historical conversation that I think happens with art that I think often makes it compelling or makes it unique or interesting. And I think that I'm very interested in that. And I think that that's something that it can't really speak to that. It can like make, it can look at some kind of, I don't know, it can, it can make something that looks cool as an image, right. but I think that it's not going to be cool in the same way that it's, there's like, the, I don't know, this sort of conversation behind it and referencing or kind of why it's cool. It doesn't seem to even understand that. Yeah, absolutely. And I always say, I mean, this is a Harold Bloom podcast. Like this is Harold Bloom fans are welcome here. I don't understand. Space for yeah. yeah, like I don't understand why people even consider him controversial at all. Uh, I'm like, you guys are retarded or you don't understand what he's saying. Like, it's like he was one of the most brilliant scholars we've had in recent history. 
But also, he didn't like. What he's not done anything that was like I don't know. I think it was during the Cannon Wars, the Cannon Wars. Yeah, in the but 80s like and okay, 90s, so what yeah. he like does he fuck with the news and thinks Shakespeare is good? Right. Yeah. Like exactly. Like, like so now, so now he see it. Like I think that is what I resent also is that I think that to make to, the kind of urge to make these people out as if they are actually conservative. I think is incredibly stupid, and I think also genuinely one. I think it means that conservatism in itself is its own sort of intellectual tradition. I think it means that then you actually don't know what to do as somebody who's left wing when you're encountered with that because you just think anything that's like what like liking like liking pretty prose is some, somehow conservative. I think right. that you're really yeah, it's shooting yourself in the foot. I think in terms of how we even have those conversations then. And it conflates so, it. It conflates it. Like you were saying, it conflates the political angle of conservatism with the actual act of art, like, which like you already said, mm -hmm. is like this kind of constant conversation with the historical art that came before. So that, that doesn't necessarily, of course, it can be political, it doesn't necessarily have to do with anything with the present day kind of political movements or what people call themselves in a political party or something. And that's what frustrates yeah, me. And I think it frustrated Bloom too, like, because people were conflating that with the kind of whatever the current political trend was. And he's like, no, I'm talking broader than that. Like, and then you're called conservative because yeah. you're just looking back at a historical context. And it's like, well, I mean, I guess there's I nothing you can do about I think it, a but... lot of it. I think a lot of it is that I think there's a significant amount of poets or lit scholars who I think don't like poetry or don't like <laughs> reading. Yeah. Which like, but like, there's a legitimate thing where I, I think that like, I often do find myself kind of wondering or frustrated where I'm like, okay, so you obviously have like an intense, um, I don't know, I feel like, have you just like invented this sort of conservative thing so you don't have to read any Milton or so you don't have to actually look into what like Percy Shelley was saying? Right. Like, I think that these are kind of accusations that like, I in some ways think it's coming, is it coming from insecurity? I mean, I guess that's kind of vaguely going into school of resentment territory, which I guess Harold Bloom kind of says more explicitly, but I do think that it is one of those things where it is a bit like, I don't know, are you, why are you being, I don't know, it seems like, why are you insecure in this very specific way? And I do think that also the first time that I read, especially much older text, or was getting into Renaissance authors, obviously as a modern person, I was like, wow, this sounds hard. Like, this is kind of not usual language. And then after that, I, and then I feel like it, shockingly it's kind of like a skill and the more you do it the more you can understand that and the, and the more interesting it makes your own prose so i think that um it's actually interesting i'm sure that we'll get into the idea of kind of sexton's influence and i yeah. think that part of what i find um interesting is that i think that she's someone who i do love and is influential on me but i do think that um the legacy of the confessionals has stalled i think i think we're still in the rut and i think oh, yes. that it's actually a lot of poetry after modernism for like, I feel like they should go back in time and they should answer for some of the crimes that have been committed in their names <laughs> against art. Absolutely. I've been banging that drum for a while now. Yeah. And I think it's infected even not just poetry, it's infected the fiction. That's why we have this auto fiction craze and the memoir craze and all of this that we're living through now is because we really haven't been able to not that we've been, I guess you sometimes stuck, but like we, we just, I feel like we were, we're not evolving. Like, before the evolution was happening every 30, 40, 50 years, there'd be a huge yeah. literary movement that pushed something forward or at least changed things. And I don't know, maybe it is insecurity, like you said, like if we don't, like it's easier to, to dismiss older stuff or say that, oh, for whatever political reason or whatever contemporary reason, it's easier to do that than it is to actually engage with it, you know? I think the same yeah. thing with the kind of psychoanalysis. I think the confessionals allowed that to flourish in the kind of scholarly yeah. side. Whereas most scholarship now is obsessed with this kind of Freudian psychoanalysis. Oh, they wrote this because of this tiny little thing that happened in their biography and stuff. And sometimes that's true and sometimes that's interesting. But I'm just like, you know, I just have a hard time buying that as somebody that tries to create and stuff like it. There's not necessarily a reason, even if it was a subconscious connection or something when they were creating like and it kind of hurts all of us that are trying to study this and that's why yeah. i just get frustrated and i bang that drum <laughs> like kind of yeah let's move I on think that, well it's interesting this reminds me of kind of two things which is i think that i think that um robert lowell who i think will come up anyway just oh, yes. tangentially in the discussion um i i 
I don't know. I have a bit of a daddy thing for Robert Lowell. I think he's great. Yeah. So, but I think that um, he, which actually Sexton did too. I bow that. I'll go with that. I'll go, <laughs> go on the tangent later. But I think that um, he, um, I think like when he, because he obviously suffered from bipolar disorder. And I think that uh, at the time, I think that in his lifetime, lithium became a kind of FDA certified treatment. And I think that he took it and his symptoms were incredibly helped. And I think that he was like, angry at the psychoanalyst and there's this letter that he sent to someone being like well i've been being convinced for my entire life that like i have this disease because i said i want to fuck my mom or like <laughs> that i have all these but like he's like i've been dealing with these crippling levels of like a psychoanalytic way of looking at this and then he has this sad thing where he's like but it was just a little bit of salt in my brain right. and i think that it's actually kind of weird it's funny but it's also kind of heartbreaking which is to think about like I mean, what is what is going going into psychoanalysis going to do about the fact that you're having a psychotic manic episode? I think that there's um, limited things that can be done. I mean, I think I also feel like with Sexton, I mean, this is another drum that I bang, which is I think that for all the sort of mental health inclus inclusivity stuff, I think that people are very uncomfortable with like severe mental health issues. Yeah. And I think that with Sexton as well, I think that she... I think that Sylvia Plath, oh man, this is such a bitchy thing to say. I think Sylvia Plath, I think, was more of a run-of-the-mill depressive, and she was very depressed. And I think that um, Sexton, if you look at her diaries, also like heard voices sometimes, or would right. go into weird amnesiac fugues. And I think that like Robert Lowell, similarly, like I think that in one manic episode, Robert Lowell, I think, showed up to his students believing that he was Caligula because Caligula was his nickname in school. And I think that like. I, I don't know. I feel like we're all like mental health can sometimes make you a little bit sad or it can make you not want to go out, but it's never like, yeah. Or it's, that's what people are like, well, yeah, like you have to take responsibility. Like it's like, guys, you know that mental health can excuse you from literally murdering someone. If it's bad yeah. enough, why are we going around being like, I don't know. They were a bit of an asshole during this time. And it's like, well, yeah, because actually I kind of do think that if you are in a psychotic state, that does excuse you of some responsibility. And I think that Sexton, um, very much, I think, more so than we think. I think that in her life, she went through something like 34 hospitalizations, Oof. which is an extreme amount of time. I think that, interestingly enough, they didn't. They tried to really keep her out of hospitals because I think that one of her psychiatrists called her a kleptomaniac of symptoms, which is interesting. Um, and that often being there would make her worse, Right. which I think is interesting. I think, um, happy to... I think I mentioned this last time, but happy to say it kind of in reference as someone who's had him, who's been institutionalized for brief period for a brief period before. I do think that there is this sort of like strange allure of the comfiness that that can have. And I think that there's a sort of um, yeah, I think that Sexton seemed to I think a lot of her poems seem to kind of oscillate from almost liking that comfort and then really wanting to go away from it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think especially contemporary times now, like it's the aesthetic is more important of that. The aesthetic of kind of mental instability or psychotic episodes is more yeah. important than uh, like like the actual horrors that that uh, that it is. And I think you and I talked about this last time too. listeners go listen to that episode. It was like this like Lowell was it made him frustrated because he couldn't his, his brain wasn't working the way he wanted it to. And like. Yeah. You know, it's it often was... ethical to creativity as well. Right, I mean, I think yeah. if you actually think of actually, this is funny. I was talking to this is years ago, like five years ago. I was talking to a therapist and I was like, I'm sleeping all the time. I'm really depressed. I feel like I'm eat like and she's like, well, you know that the we used to call depression. Um, it's actually a cognitive retardation. And I was like, <laughs> yes, I feel retarded. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm not I'm not writing. And I'm like, I'm falling behind on my work. But like. I don't, this idea of it somehow being sort of, again, manic pixie dream girl and just sort of like, I'm like, okay, so do you want an actual manic pixie dream book girl? Because then I can like lock up, spend all of your money, take my clothes off and punch someone in the face. That's not really what you want. Or right. it's like, I think that there's a sort of, um, yeah, overly sort of um, weird, yeah, like this aesthetic of it, which I think is interesting, because I do think that there's poems by Sexton's where I think that she leans in or romanticizes some of it herself as well. Yeah. And I do think that it is something that I think is kind of, I think in some ways, I wonder 
her own narrative around it. Well, actually, with her first collection. So she started to write when she was 28. And I think that she was hospitalized for the first time then. And she started to write in a writing therapy class, which is interesting. So she was interested in poetry before. I think that there's this quote by her where she said, like, she thought that she was only good for having babies and making white soup. And if she could do that well enough, everything would go away. Right. And that her psychiatrist recommended that she start writing. And I think that um, that is such a different way of going into poetry that it is from um, anybody like the other, like her contemporaries, for example, who are mostly academics. I mean, I think that Anne Sexton eloped at 19 and never got any higher education. She was always very embarrassed, actually, about her kind of lack of canonical knowledge. But um, yeah, I think that her way of getting into writing, I think, was explicitly from her institutionalizations, which obviously are such a heavy feature throughout her work. Right. And I think also, I guess, um, I remember once I was in a, when I was in the hospital, I was in a poetry therapy class and I got kicked out for cheating because I'm a poet. <laughs> One of the patients was like, this isn't fair. I'm not going to do this with a fucking poet here. <laughs> like, can she leave? Like, she like knows how to write poetry. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I don't want to be here either because like, like I'm just focusing on making a good poem. It's actually impossible for me to like write poetry therapeutically. I'm like already thinking about editing it. And they were like, yeah, Sarah, just like go to your room. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, it's such a different way of kind of entering the art form. And I do think that it also means that I think Sexton's narrative about herself was one of sort of, I don't know, like, I was a dissatisfied housewife and then I suddenly had a breakdown and I think that her she I think that she probably in some problematic ways links her creativity to her sort of instabilities or at least I think that that's something that I think because she was so praised yet derided by some people but I'm often praised for her sort of being open about taboo subjects I think is there a sort of risk you take when when it's like well how, how, do you run out of things to share right like or do you, do you have to like almost like do you have to generate new content if that's how you're kind of being esteemed as a poet is through your sort of blatant honesty in the face of these things i almost wonder if there's a sort of weirdness of like well i don't know i'm <laughs> i guess i'm gonna have an affair now right or like, yeah or like what else like i'm gonna run out of things to confess absolutely absolutely that's 100 percent. i think that's i think that's something that happens now too with with people they they tie it to almost like this kind of like writerly identity where and then if you run out of that or you've said everything you have to say about that it becomes very difficult to pivot you know or or try something different and then you start to either repeat yourself or yeah seek out these kind of things to write about because you can't come up with ideas uh yeah i but, feel like there's like the trauma industrial complex with yeah. like essays but i think that it's often one of those things where i think that it often takes women who want to be writers and i think that their first piece will be like the worst thing that's ever happened to them right and i think that i think that one i think that's a really if they actually want to be writers it's an incredibly like i don't know i think that mix of exploitative thing to do but also just like this i think that then often it's like i think that there's this one horrible story where i think a girl was like i don't know like i was separated from my dad at birth and then we ended up meeting and having sex and i think that that was like her debut and i think that she had an interview after where she's like yeah i guess everybody just wants to know about that and i'm like yeah i would have kept that like in my skeleton box for a while yeah i don't know like like, I feel bad, but, like, that's that's how you introduced yourself, like, to the literary scene. Like, actually, that's going to probably stick. I mean, I think that um, what I find frustrating, which, again, I think the confessionals have a lot to answer for, despite a lot of my love for them, is that I think that we used, I think poetry, it used to be very accepted that poetry could be about more than just expressing yourself. Right. Or at least, I mean, we had the whole escape from personality by T.S. Eliot, where he's, like, anybody who's interesting almost kind of writes poetry to escape their own personality. And it isn't a sort of magnification or like intensification of it. And I think that the confessionals, I think very much turn it into both a sort of ex personal expression thing, but I think you're right, a sort of identity thing and not in this sort of political way that obviously people work with identity politics now. I mean, I think that 
in some ways, the immediate pre like pre predecessors like Sharon Olds or Adrian Rich, I think are people who I think much more played with this idea of both confession and politics as being tied um, much more so than I, th I think that Sexton actually what it, I think that like there's an interview which is like what do you think about women's lib and she said like I'm a chauvinist or something so I don't <laughs> think that she, I think like her answer was just like I love men right, so I think yeah. that like, I don't think that um I think that the kind of post mortem of Anne Sexton and class work as if they're sort of victims of this like Betty Friedian feminine mystique sad housewife from the 60s who's over educated mentality I think again is something that's not reflected in their work if you read them and not something that they themselves would speak to. I think that it is frustrating to see them kind of both seen as sort of co-opted as like examples of like the patriarchy being bad somehow, when I don't think that that's how either of them would have conceived of themselves. Right. Yeah, that reframing is always frustrating. But yeah, let's get into it here too. Listeners, we have the same version of this book uh, from uh, Mariner Books here, The Complete Poems of Anne Sexton. And Sarah has agreed to uh, very generously come here and go through this entire fucking book with us here on Heavy Board. So it's going to be multiple parts. We're going to try to get through like the first three or four books of uh, Saxon here. We'll see how far we go. It's, it's 620 pages. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a lot. I mean, I think that um, what is it, which is in the um, introduction by Maxine Kuhlman, I think that she does say something where at the end of her life, writing either got too easy or too difficult for Anne Sexton, which is why there is a lot of strange, I feel like we're starting, I think that um, as a sort of development as a writer, I think that first two, interesting, three to five, mwah, love it. And then after that, I like a lot of it, but we're gonna have some weird discussions because yeah. I know it, it, she gets off the hinge. She becomes obsessed with, um, do you know what's his name? Do you know Jeffrey? Is it, yeah, Jeffrey Smart. Wait, no, it's not Christopher Smart. No, no. Again, he's like this famous. He has that one long poem that's always anthologized. He was like a bit pre-romantic, sort of around the same time as Alexander Pope. He had this long, weird poem called "For I Shall Consider My Cat Jeffrey," and I think that is essentially he was like a crazy ass, like random man who lit like old random poet who was famous for being in men's mental hospitals. And I think that at one point she's like, I'm just going to write a book like imitating him. And it's like, huh, that guy who like nobody has read because he's mostly just crazy. I mean, I would <laughs> like if he was like very much like looking at the back, I think that she really is kind of plundering forms. Like she has a lot of Psalms. I think that she has a lot of odes. Like I think that like it, it gets crazy so i think that i'm excited oh yeah she has all these poems which is um like the fury of sundays the fury of things one of those is called the fury of cox and i love that um in an interview with her with this poem someone said yeah so this poem the fury of cox what did you mean and she says i meant cox <laughs> <laughs> which i think is actually i think that wonderfully charming i think that um i because I did my undergraduate dissertation on her. So I'm not actually, I think that most of my weird knowledge, I think most of this is coming from me being a kind of obsessive teenager mixed with a small bit of university specialism, but she's not, I've not written on her in ages. But I think that when you read her interviews, she definitely has a sense of humor, which is funny because I think that I'd be intrigued to see how much we think it does or doesn't come out in her kind of work. I think that she develops a sense of humor a bit later on. Yeah. But I think in person, I think in person you could tell why so many people threw themselves at her. I mean, I think even in the cover of this book, I think that yeah. she's like weirdly sexy and alluring. She was a model, but I think that she has this sort of, I don't know, if you, have you ever seen her on film? I know I'm like rambling only, now. Only but... when she was like older and like her voice had turned to that kind of like smoker's voice, you know? I see, I find that sexy, the smoker's voice, <laughs> but but there's this one bit where she's like being interviewed and she puts on um, Chopin's ballad number one. And I think that she starts saying to the interviewer where she's like, this is so beautiful, beautiful. And then she's like, oh my gosh, I think I'm gonna have an orgasm in front of you. <laughs> and she like starts like being like, oh my God, like in this interview and like in rapture to this music. And I think that she is kind of terrifying, but kind of magnetic. I think yeah. that I can see why, um, I think that again, which I think is a really big stark co contrast to, I think, um, I think Sexton sort of more type A, uh, Plath sort of more type A kind of quiet inner fury. I think that, um, 
yeah, Sexton, I think, gave herself and personality wise, I think, um, to the public and like a lot more so. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is why we're, we're going to have to separate it, listeners. So there's going to be multiple parts to this kind of if Sarah coming back on the podcast here and we're going to be going over all of Sexton stuff. But I always like to start this off, Sarah, with just kind of what is your history with this book specifically and then more broadly Sexton in general? Yeah, so I think I'd actually say Sexton was probably the first poet who I really, really loved. And I think I was given this book when I was 14 by my grandma. So my grandma was amazing. She was very, she was an academic. And I think that um, she gave me this book. And I think that at the time, I think even my mom was like, is she old enough? Some of the Some of the themes are a bit mature here, but I think that she kind of gave it to me and she was like, you can squirrel it away. Like you don't need to show your mom. And I think that I kind of carried this book around obsessively with me for a really long time. And I think that um, it's probably, I would say, I think that Plath, I think is so, I mean, I don't know. I think that Plath, a lot of Plath poetry, I think that of course as, a, as an angsty teenage girl, I think I went to Plath first. And I think that if you're looking for teenage angst, you don't actually get much of that in Plath. And I think that she actually has a sort of, I don't know, very shard-like kind of quality to her, where I think that there's something that's very sharp and considered, and I think that very well crafted. And I think that I could kind of relate, I think, more to the sort of sprawlingness of a lot of Sexton's poetry. And I think, of course, the kind of drama of it, it's incredibly dramatic and pathetic. And I think that I like that. I think it's also incredibly feminine as well, which yeah. is I think part of what attracted me to it when I was kind of 14. And so I think I carried this around with me for like pretty much all the time. And I think that um, I wrote my dissertation when I was an undergraduate on how I think that Sexton, again, I think that when we think about confessional, we always think about the I. And I think that actually what I said Sexton does amazingly is use the pronoun you. And I think that um, she really implicates the reader. And I think that you get to this very uncomfortable, almost relationship with her as a person while you read the poems, which is like, well, she's made it so if I don't like these poems, I feel like I'm like judging her and want her to kill herself or something, right. which is, I think I think that that's an uncomfortable and interesting thing to do as an almost literary technique. I think that is kind of provocative. And I think that um, I was very intrigued that with the, with the beginning of From Bedlam to Part Way Back, um, it starts with you is the first, I guess, line of any of her books. And I think that that's sort of what, um, I've always been attracted to with Sexton, which is I think that she has a sort of implicatory quality that you have with her. Yeah, and it was fresh. It was, nobody had really done this before, like in terms of that specific thing that you're talking about, that kind of daring you to like it or, or, or uh, yeah, for me it was like, I didn't come to, sec to Sexton until college, essentially, like, uh, so I was, you know, in my teens and I think what I, you know, I didn't even have a book like this or any of her books, like, especially not like a complete big fat, uh, complete poems like this <clears throat> until I was well into college. But like, you know, you basically, my first introduction was the anthologized, the anthologized stuff. So like her kind and all of that. And, uh, you know, I liked it. I was intrigued by it for all the things that you said, like the same reasons it was kind of incredibly bold in this kind of really feminine way. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, and then I just kind of got this huge collection and started going through it. The first time I ever went through this, I was probably oh. like 22, 23. And it was kind of, I don't know. I don't think I got everything out of it the first time. It's like something like reading it this time and especially like taking notes on it to like talk with you about it and stuff. Like it's interesting too, as you age and you're reading things like this, like, you're going back and seeing, like we talked in a little bit in the beginning about like our old notes from when we were younger in a book like this and, and seeing them and almost laughing to ourselves. Like, oh, we didn't quite understand what she was going for here just yet. Like you kind of need yeah. that maturity, but yeah. I think that also she's a poet who I think actually is benefited from having this whole thing to look at because I think that if I were to be given a sort of greatest hits of Anne Sexton, I, I'm not sure if it would have snagged me in the same way. I think that when I was given this, I think part of what I really loved is that I feel like, I don't know, um, when I was, again, like a sort of 
16 year old teenager, I think I would always love, I would try to do bibliomancy. So I'd kind of like scroll through the book and on a page, put my hand on the line. And I'm like, that's what my day will be like, or something ridiculous like that. But I think that actually having that was a really good way of going through almost all of the book, because I think that it meant that I was kind of going into loads of sorts of different areas of it all at once. And I think that it was, she was again, maybe part of why I started to really like her was that I, um, she was probably the first poet, I had a significant amount of their poems. So I think that I really felt like I could really get to know what was happening there. And it wasn't sort of like, I think again, I think um, I think I, I love T.S. Eliot and I love Sylvia Plath, but they were really limited in their output. I think that this was something where it was like, I can really just get immersed with this. And I think that I almost began to find this book sort of weirdly comforting to always have around me. Yeah. Um, it was actually the one thing that I think that when I was moving from my old flat, I noticed that it was in their bookshelf. And I was like, I'm sorry, this is like the one thing, you have a lot of my books in there and I don't care. This is actually like, I need this. It's definitely the oldest book that I have that I still carry around with me. And I'm, um, yeah, it's kind of doodled out as well. I mean, uh -huh. <laughs> it's like lo lo loads and loads of doodles. Um, I actually, when I was a teenager, had two different bands, none of which became real things based on and Sexton Lines. I think I really liked the idea of 45 Mercy Street as a band title when I was 16, which I don't like now. Um, but apparently Peter Gabriel has a song called that about Anne Sexton, which I yeah. found out when I was reading. Um, and then the other one is a title of a poem, which is later on in her life, which is Scorpio, Bad Spider, Die. <laughs> and so I really liked that. I'm also a Scorpio. So I think that there is a lot of, yeah, she was kind of someone who I carried around with me a lot. What did you, uh, so what did you think of the introduction by uh, Maxine Kuhlman? You know what? It's interesting to go back on it because I think that she sounds pretty defensive of her. Yeah. Like the tone is one of defending almost the fact that this exists, which I thought was very interesting. I mean, I think that is fascinating because I, I liked that she has, um, she spoke a lot about how actually her writing process was very sort of like regimented where she would really, what was it like? There's this one bit in it that I like, yeah, which is here, which is like when she was trying to write and she'd have kind of ideas um, it was like, she would say, why don't you pound it into form? And often the experiment worked. So I think that she was almost trying to sort of show that Sexton was not this sort of hot mess writing on like, I don't know, the scrawls of her receipts and that she really did have this sort of disciplined attitude towards writing her poetry, which I think, um, I think, she, I think was a kind of, yeah, maybe um, I think stereotype of her. I think, of course, obviously loads about her psych I think that um, psychiatric history, and I think, of course, that's going to be, I mean, do you know that her, like, tapes to her therapist are literally published in a book? No, I never. Dude, isn't that insane? There's yeah. actually, like, a huge debate. They were published in, like, the set in 75, and since then, there's been loads of scholars who are like, wait, why do we do that? So, because she would record her own therapy sessions with a doctor called Dr. Orn. And I think that it was because she would often forget what she would say in therapy or take on like a different identity. I mean, I think that it's kind of interesting because I think that this was all before the sort of like DID trendy obsession stuff. <laughs> like, reading it is suddenly like, and you do, I think I do really wonder what like Anne Sexton would have been like on, on mental health TikTok. Yeah. I think that she could be one of those people who's like recording a switch or something like that, which <laughs> like, like the people with multiple personalities do. But I think that she would um, record her therapy sessions and they were kind of released. So I think that that's kind of tied. I thought it was kind of interesting though, at the end of the introduction that I think that, yeah, she says, Women poets in general owe a debt to Anne Sexton, who broke new ground, shattered taboos, and endured a barrage of attacks. And it says she wrote openly about menstruation, abortion, masturbation, drug addiction, at a time when the proprieties embraced none of these proper topics for poetry. I think that I, um, I think it's interesting because I think that I, maybe this is me being perhaps ungrateful, but I think it's also just, I, th I think what I get from Sexton is not necessarily the sort of taboo topic. So I don't think that that's necessarily how I feel her influence. I feel like there's almost an incredible level of warmth and also an ability to be wrong and I think take steps, which I think attracts me to her. I think that 
I'm kind of in, I think that the beginning, I think kind of says like, we, yeah, we should be reading her. She's earned her place in the canon. And then it's also kind of like, forget about her mental health thing. She was good, but also I'm going to talk about her mental health right. the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's kind of like one of those don't think about an elephant sort of things, but I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm being bitchy tonight for some reason. I don't know why. No, we love it. <laughs> we love it. But what, what, what did you make of it? I think Maxine Human also is like not that good of a poet. So yeah, I had never really read her poetry, but I guess like her friendship with Sexton like made her be sought out to write this kind of introduction. I guess it is. Yeah, I think you're right. It's it's kind of defensive introduction. Uh, but I guess this was originally written and published this big fat, you know, complete works uh, in 1981. So I guess that was like when when did when did Sexton kill herself? Is this seventy seven? Yeah, that makes sense. It was, yeah, uh, maybe. So, yeah. Will it say on the back? I feel like it probably will. Like probably no. So she was writing in seventy three. So I guess yeah, seventy seventy seven makes sense. Oh, seventy four. It's right here in the introduction. Seventy four is yeah. when she killed herself. Which would make sense that that's like her therapy sessions were published after she was dead because she probably wouldn't let that happen if she were alive. Well, yeah. Well, what a batshit ass thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, it is kind of interesting because there was a lot of her friends who were debating what sex and herself would have thought of it. I mean, also at the end of her life, I think a lot of people kind of blame this for the kind of acceleration of her suicide is that she was sleeping with her therapist. Right. And I think that, like, I think that Maxine Cuban, I think in a different essay, is like, so you're telling me that you pay like eighty pound, eighty dollars three times a week to get laid yeah. and go to it. And the idea, and I think that it is kind of interesting in reflection because I think that she wrote a kind of retrospective on it, which is like, well, in hindsight, at that time in the seventies, terms like abuse or grooming were not that just wasn't what we were thinking. We were thinking like, wow, what a crazy, stupid thing to do. Right. But I think that obviously, as we look back on that, the idea of someone like if she was in a very vulnerable position we obviously look kind of very different now onto that relationship and i think that that's kind of taken more blame and heat as kind of time has gone on as a sort of catalyst for kind of some of her issues yeah wasn't it like was it freud or young that was uh that it was banging their patients as well isn't that that, that movie I think, yeah, uh... I think young. yeah no wait so i want to see the movie uh, what is the name of the movie again uh, it's uh, like a dangerous letter, method but... a dangerous method Thing. should i watch it so because i think that this guy was a huge asshole always wanted to watch it with me it's, and i think that i haven't watched it in years uh but it's i like fassbender and fassbender's in it uh michael fassbender <clears throat> but uh i haven't seen it in since whenever it came out it was i don't I remember thinking it was okay like it was interesting but not like a great movie because like the whole plot is about like these two kind of freud and young talking to each other on a park bench like kind of discussing their patience and the methods and things and so of which uh, are dangerous. yeah and it that but i think it's the same thing like like when you're in that position it's it's almost like the same thing as like the you know the kind of I guess it's almost a stereotype now where like the people start banging their priest or their like pastor because they're trying yeah. to get closer to God or something. And like, there's just a weird, something conflicts in the human mind. And we start like, cause you feel yeah. comfortable, you're getting kind of guidance and maybe it's the daddy thing. I don't know. I mean, I mean I think they, well, don't they, I think that they teach therapists and psychiatrists not to follow in love with their patients. Yeah. Like, I think that there's specific classes about it. And I think that it's also just probably because you have a very disarming intimacy with someone. Yeah. I mean, one of my best friends is actually someone who was a nurse when I was at hospital. But I think that he got into, I got in touch with him like two years after I'd left and I was feeling much better. But I remember at the time I'd like made him a little stupid goodbye card, which I think like had a heart on it or something. And he's like, sir, I'm going to have to give this to staff. This is hella illegal. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I guess I'll never hear from you again. But I do think that those things kind of accelerate feelings of intimacy and I think accelerate sorts of like, I think um, also, I think that obviously, I mean, this is such a, it's kind of interesting, I think how we think about how we diagnose people kind of after their death, especially when the kind of contemporary concepts wouldn't exist anymore. But I do think that um, sex and obviously had a very difficulty with lack of boundaries and I think an identity issue. I think that there's this one interview of hers where I think that she was, um, I think they asked her like, well, what, what do you think you'd be good at if you weren't a writer? And the only thing that she could think of is that she thought that she'd make a good prostitute. 
And so I think that that's, but I think that a lot of that though is because I think that she saw herself as a sort of seductive shapeshifter who I think had poor boundaries. And I think in some ways probably took solace in the flirtation and the seduction in itself as maybe a sort of identity she could cling on to, or at least as a way of feeling wanted. Yeah, it's an interesting thing because I'm thinking now of like, I didn't prepare for this, but like, I always say that is of that's like, and Camille Paglia says this all the time. We're like, that is Paglia Pod, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah. And uh, she, like, about like that is the sexual allure is one of the most powerful tools in the kind of feminine arsenal, you know? Yeah, sure. How it is kind of, and when you're as beautiful as Sexton was, it's, not, not even, even that you're not even intending it to be that way, but it just like you realize that you can mani- probably from a young age. I'm sure she realized that she could manipulate men and everybody around her of any age to her will. It is a very weird. It is a very weird experience because I think, um, of course, I think that there is a sort of. I think that she very much does kind of yeah she's aware of even if she's not even being the role of the kind of seductress then she knows how to be the role of the sort of helpless needing help girl, or can be the sort of almost like, I think that she can play with these multiple feminine archetypes in ways that, again, you're right, I think kind of allow her, I guess like, yeah, it's a powerful thing to do. And I wonder, um, if, it's, I think that, I wonder if it's amusing too, at a certain point, like when she gets older, it's almost amusing to see kind of men squirm around her. And some, you know, like it's, yeah. that's why I get the Paglia kind of like, it is, kind of I get that. I think under that, um, understudied it, really yeah like in terms of yeah, is that this also, a real I thing that yeah you realize that it's very easy to flirt with i think that i'm someone who i think sadly i can't help that i'm like naturally fucking charismatic i think right. that i'm always <laughs> people that are always like well you were flirting with this person or like this person I, I, there's no way though you can talk about it without being conceited or seeming to imply that you think that you're somehow especially charming or beautiful which of course i am but uh, no i think <laughs> But I think that it is kind of interesting because I think that I can see that the not in a way that I would say that, again, I've used my powers for evil, but right. I think that there is sort of, um, yeah, I think that it's a role that you can easily slit into. And I think that um, there's almost a sort of, yeah, almost boredom where I think that it's like, okay, well, like, now that she knows pretty much anybody she wants to sleep with her will sleep with her. It's almost like, in some ways if you're competitive with yourself it's like okay well not like everybody who wasn't supposed to sleep with me is sleeping with me anyway like i think that like okay i've realized that people will sleep with me even though i'm married and even though they know my husband and then it's like well who else is not supposed to sleep with me i guess my psychiatrist okay well now he is i mean after that who else is going to fuck you who's not allowed to fuck you god like you kind of you start to get it's almost kind of maybe almost as a weird sense of disillusionment where it's like well, I'm disillusioned by like almost becoming too powerful with this ability to sort of, and what am I getting from it? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I wonder if it is kind of like human rights in the, in the um, intro about how like at a certain point when she started gaining notoriety as a writer and becoming like this big figure in the literary world, she kind of started to call herself a god in certain senses. And it, it is almost yeah, like a yeah, godlike yeah. power where she's almost toying with like these people that are so like all of their, their reserve, all of their self-control can be thrown out the window. If she like, again, if somebody like of her beauty or her stature kind of bats their eyes at you, like it just kind of, it really is like a very, I mean, I'm talking about strictly from like an interesting kind of, I don't, I don't yeah, want to say anthropological, but just kind of like, yeah, like this kind of, that's the dance between the sexes, right? Like that's the, that's why I brought up Paglia and all that. But yeah, because we should talk think, about her allure, like her fashion model, her glamour, like her. Absolutely. I think that also, this is a story that I think so demonstrates her sort of, so I think that I've been thinking about this a lot as well, which is I think that, um because I've been thinking that, there's a, I think that I'm trying to think what are the traits that I think make people, men specifically, act like that. And I think some of it is, I think, a mix of glamour and seduction. But I think also, I guess, sort of a having that whilst being very personal, but also kind of flouting society's normal standards. So I think that what an example of this is with Sexton is that when she went into a writing class in Boston, which is at Boston College with Robert Lowell, who is teaching it, and, and, and Sylvia Plath was there. I think that Sylvia Plath would show up and have all of her notes and be sitting very carefully. Sexton would show up late 
take off her high heel and use it as an ashtray <laughs> and start and start saying when I, and Robert Lowell would read a poem and I think that she'd be like well, you know what? You wouldn't let us get a, get away with lines like that. I don't think it's that good. Why don't you explain why it's good to us? And I think that there's a sort of like, I think this, the term bratty is probably highly sexualized in a way that's not quite that. But I think that there's a sort of mix of, I think that that's a quite intense feminine power thing to do, to be ashing your yeah. cigarette into your heel when they tell you not to smoke and saying that you think that the poems aren't good. It's a sort of like here, I, like, here we are now, entertain us female version it's almost it's almost like that sharon stone scene right and that 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 what are you gonna do arrest me for smoking you know like like exactly. yeah it very it, kind it, of that's that i think um she realized it's so funny because you know when i was a teenager and even i think i thought this until like stupidly late so i'm 29 now i think that um <laughs> Anne sexton married her husband kayo his name is called Kayo, like as in like uh, pronounced K-O, like knockout, because he was known for being such a bruiser. So he like, and he was he was like traumatized by the Korean War, like he had his own, but I think that they married at 19. And I think that they were together for an astonishingly long time, despite these affairs, despite these things. I think that when they divorced, she died about a year later. Right. So for a long time, I was like, so what I need to do is get married young and like it doesn't matter what the relationship is like but it's kind of like I guess like I, like I guess it seemed to kind of work for her I don't know what I was thinking at the time but I was thinking like yeah she had that as a sort of anchor and that kind of helped her through her life even though obviously like they were they both rapaciously cheated on each other I mean and also like love poems which is I think one of I think her fourth or fifth collection I think um, it's literally just a poem about cheating on your husband. Right. It's, just like, it's like literally like the most cucked man alive. Uh, can you also imagine being like a veteran coming back from the Korean War and then you find out that your wife has published a book about just like having sex with loads of other people while you were away? Right. I feel like, 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 damn, that is like PTSD territory. But um, yeah, I think that... Um, it's kind of interesting that as well as her sort of like, again, such high stature as a seductress, she was pretty much a young wife. And I think that she really only stepped into this era when she was 28 and started gaining fame and publishing these poems. I think that this book probably came out when she was like 30-ish, which is, I guess, around my age. And I think that she develops as a writer further on. So I think that, um, yeah, we have a post-wall woman writing <laughs> with a lot of power. <laughs> So, God, yeah. like, the red pill is found dead in the corner. <laughs> yeah, and, just, and it's telling that, like, it, it's always brought up. Like, this, her, it's always, it's such a huge part of her. Like, like how, like, how, I would guess this is a question I had. Like, how much of, of her beauty, like, how much is that a part of her body of work and reputation and stuff because like even in the very first paragraph here we're, we're talking about her looks like humans talking about the first time she met her in 57 tall blue eyed stunningly slim uh dark hair decorated with flowers her face skillfully made up looked every yeah. inch the fashion model <laughs> and like yeah earrings and bracelets french perfume high heels matching lip and finger gloss bedecked her all intimidating sophistications like these kind of uh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I guess I, yeah. How much of that is a part of this kind of the legend or the, the, the ethos of Sexton, you know, in the kind of literary canon and her reputation. That's so interesting. And I think that even in the first poem, there's a line at the end, which is once I was beautiful, now I am myself, which is also like kind of amusing. Cause I think that what she does, which is, I think that I, I wonder if it's often brought up because again, she almost dared to have a sort of, I don't know. She she dared to kind of own it or at least like not do this sort of coy, oh, me sort of thing. I think that there's a sort of, I think that if you think about flirting with glamour, I think that she'd be much more kind of self-notarizing like, um, like Lord Byron or someone almost more similar to that in the way that there is a sort of, I don't know, ability to sort of lean in to that sort of image where I think a lot of poets... I mean, mostly because poets, I think, as, as I said on the last podcast, most poets are ugly and, like, not charming. <laughs> so, I think, so I think that, like, generally, I think that that um, was already a sort of asset. And I think also in that way, I think made her probably, I guess, a curio amongst, if you, if you can imagine, I guess, her, again, rocking up, ashing her cigarette in her heels, 
everybody else at the writing class, like Sylvia Plath had worked um, in Cambridge, was studying, had studied at Cambridge. And I think that people are coming from these very academic backgrounds. And I think for her to be like, why do you write poetry? And she's like, I don't know, I'm crazy. And they told right. me to, but that's an incredibly different, like I think that there's almost a sort of vague class element as well, where I think that she breaks this sort of code of being sort of properly feminine, like this sort of proper uptight femininity. And I think kind of more identifies with the sort of like, well, I'm just gonna say it. And I think that that's something that, I think that people like, something that I've realized is I think that people like to be around people who break the rules before they do. So then they feel like they have permission to break the rules. So yes. I think that if she's going around saying to Robert Lowell, well, I don't think this is that good of a poem where I'm smoking. I think that almost allows people around her to be like, well, she's broken the rules. So now my rule that I'm going to break is I'm going to cheat on my wife with her right. <laughs> or something like that. But I think that there's a sort of, um, I think people feel often maybe perhaps even liberated by her ability to say it first. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and I wonder, I guess, because like you were, it kind of breaks the upper class taboo, which was getting broken at the time too, right? Like the kind of Brahmin Massachusetts, like families, yeah. like powerful, high ranking, like kind of proper civilized families that are, have all been descended from the Europeans that came over to the Americans, to the Americas. And it was like, breaking with that <clears throat> and that was her way in maybe like maybe because the beauty was like a tool <clears throat> even to break through that right to break through that and then like the kind of stuffy scholarly side of things it was her way of of putting her foot in the door and like everybody and was kind of stunned and just like let it just what i like is that i think that she had that power and i think that having that i think a worse poet or a worse kind of some maybe just even worse poet or even less ambitious person is that i think that with that, she did also put the work in as well, which is what kind of Maxine Human says in the beginning, which is I think that she was actually, what I find interesting, especially looking in the beginning things is how much she actually works with rhyme yeah. and in form. And I think that even though she's quite metrically clunky at a lot of periods, and I think that even though there's things that don't quite land, I think that you have a sense of she wants to be a good poet beyond merely just sort of talking about herself. And again, this is where there's a lot of kind of experimenting with different forms, a lot of different sort of dramatic monologues and things like that that are in there. And I think that that's something that I think is kind of, um, yeah, interesting. Cause I think that it's not just like, cause otherwise she could just write a gossip column or a newspaper. Right. I think the fact that she's chosen poetry and then decides to actually be good at it is not an accident. Right, absolutely. Yeah, like that Lowell quote in the beginning, like, uh for a book or two she grew more powerful than writing was too easy or too hard for her she became meager and exaggerated many of her most embarrassing poems would have been fascinating if someone had put them in quotes yeah, <laughs> yeah. no i use i think i read that when i was young so i used to use that as a trick all the time and i think that it was something where i think i remember with my first little pamphlet that i wrote is that because i really fought against this idea of wanting to be seen as confessional that I was like, well, I guess it's not confessional if I just put it in quotations. <laughs> and it's like, you can make anybody say it, but I think it's almost a sort of, yeah, I'm intrigued by that as a sort of um, thing. I think Anne Sexton was also someone who had the, um, if you look at Lowell and Adrian Rich, they both had eulogies for her. And I think that she had the weirdest eulogies of anybody. I think that um, Anne's, Adrian Rich really politicized her death and said something that's like, once we learn how to leave abusive men, we will become immune to suicide. And it's like, well, I don't know, dude, she like left her husband and then killed herself. Right. I don't like, I think, um, and I think that Robert Lowell, again, I just love that he does this, he did this with Plath a bit too, where it's like, oh no, they've died. Well, time to be slightly bitchy, which is very baby girl of him. Yeah. In his eulogies though, he kind of has this moment where he's like, well, maybe I'm going to like take that like slight swipe at it. And it's kind of like, I don't know. Oh my gosh, Lil. Like, I feel kind of embarrassed reading it, but it is very amusing. Yeah. I wonder so, too. I, just... I mean, yeah, no worries. Like, I wonder if um, somebody like Lil would see that as like, not, not like an opportunity to say what you really think. Cause I mean, not that he was afraid or something like that, but I feel like, especially for the pretty girls, he was definitely probably I would be intimidated. Too, yeah. Wait, one of my favorite stories actually is that after Sexton died, so she was teaching in Boston at the time. And I think that um, they had to take, they had to find a writer to take over her students. 
And I think that it was Elizabeth Bishop. <laughs> and Elizabeth Bishop, though, writes about, she's like, these fucking students, like, obviously not using that, but she's like, they're all writing poems about broken black little hearts. <laughs> and like, or like pretty little pink, like feelings and broken hearts and like blackness. <laughs> and she's like, I can so tell that they applied because of Sexton. And now they're getting Elizabeth Bishop, who is in my mind, probably one of the most opposites. I think that if like Sexton is one of the most heterosexual women who's ever lived in terms of that, I think Bishop is obviously one of the most kind of um, gay women who's ever lived. Oh, yeah. And I think that they're going to be so attracting an incredibly different kind of asset um, and kind of, yeah, league of writers. And I think I can just imagine it being a fucking nightmare to be like, OK, well, she's done it. And now you have to read all these poems about someone's mom. When like yeah. they're like life, I think that she would have had obviously no time for that. I do love, uh, yeah, I do always. Have, I have a very big soft spot for Bishop, and we talked about this before. Yeah, with the. She's... Well, did you see those? She's name dropped in the beginning in a funny way. Where, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when Maxine Cumin says like, before there was a move, before there was a women's movement, the underground river was already flowing, carrying such diverse cargo as the poems of Bogan, Levertov, Rukasir. Swenson, Plath, Ridge, and Sexton. And then as asterisks, I've omitted from this list Elizabeth Bishop, who chose not to have her work included in anthologies of women poets. <laughs> I feel like, does that seem, how do we read that? Is that kind of passive aggressive? I think it's kind of funny. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's, it's definitely, a, yeah, it's definitely a, a mark against, right? Definitely. Which I, I, I mean, I'm a huge Bishop fan as well. So I think that um, I think that I'm very yeah I, I was very amused at, uh, and I think that I really respect um, Elizabeth Bishop's opinion to like not have her work in women's only anthologies. I think that generally, with my intuitions, I go in the same direction as that. But yeah, I think that um, such a little funny swipe where it's like, well, she chose not, but you know, <laughs> we were part of the underground river, and <laughs> it's like, okay, well. Actually, of the poets that you've listed, I think only three of them I like. So, <laughs> absolutely. I don't know. Yeah, I know. I'm really on some kind of bullshit today. I think it's no. because I've been. I think, I think that the weather in London is changing, so it's become spring. I'm gonna go feed some lambs tomorrow from a bottle with milk. I'm very excited. <laughs> I feel bad. It's gonna be like all families with little kids, and then me and this other girl are just gonna show up and take stupid e-girl photos with lambs. <laughs> I think that um, I've been feeling. I've been feeling better, so I like way better. So I think that I've been having, um, uh, yeah. So my bit, uh, and I feel like the podcast is just an amazing kind of medium for bitchiness. Absolutely, I, I liked being on your last one so much. I was like, damn, I want to start a podcast now. Yeah, <laughs> it was so much fun. But I, I'm enjoying being a guest. Good, good. Yeah, and like I said, you're going to be a guest for a while here as we get through this. We still haven't even gotten to the books yet. The last thing I, I wanted know, to I mean, ask. It's been like an hour and a half, and I yeah. <laughs> We've covered a lot of ground, though. I mean, I think um, also in a dumb way, I think that it's always useful because I think that I forget how much like in the same way some guys are really into facts about like World War One or trains. I think that this is kind of my like weird specialism unlocked where I'm like, whoa, I actually like I guess this is like somehow paying off <laughs> so I can yeah. like be vaguely useful in this sort of weird thing. So I'm enjoying it. And I think that the podcast format, it just, it, one, it allows us to kind of weave in between, like you said, the kind of intellectual knowledge that you have from being, you know, overeducated in the universities for years, <laughs> but then also the kind of basic human a aspects, like the kind of personal taste aspects, kind of just the fucking around, you know, like it just, and plus it gets more, eye, like more, more people will listen to a podcast and they will read an essay in some obscure journal, you know, about this kind of stuff. Yeah, Totally. But the last question I had about the introduction before we moved to the first book was just like uh, about Holmes, her first kind of mentor. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So because I think that he so she because I think that let me have a look at it because I think that she was reading. So I think that she'd read Snodgrass. What a horrible name. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I just think that's like one of those like I think it's very funny. We kind of see names as sort of. Um, I don't know, kind of uh, deterministic. I think Sexton, I mean, she has sex in her fucking name, incredibly right. deterministic. I think um, Snodgrass really does sound like a tissue. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I think John Holmes, I think was, yeah, one of her first me mentors. I think that was he the one who told her that she was going too far? Yeah, and like she calls him, I think a few times is like, 
at least Cumin puts in this introduction that she refers to him as her poetic father a lot of yeah. times. And, and he was there's... like, I guess, finger wagging at her probably a lot in those workshops where he was kind of like, um, I don't know. But I, I just think it's interesting about this kind of this thing about mentorship and this kind of this idea of mentorship in general, too, and especially when you talk about somebody who's as big and kind of canonized as Sexton with the reputation yeah. and all. Yeah. What do you, what do you well, think about like, that in terms of like mentorship and like, and yeah, of course, in terms of sex and then of course of your own and, and in general. Question. I mean, I think that without having this kind of external support of a poet who took like a real poet who took interest in her outside of just sort of asylums, I think that um, that I don't, I don't think that she would have been able to really write or have the confidence or even know where to start with reading things to properly kind of flourish. So I think that that's, incredibly important and i think that he they worked really closely together um i think that it's on part two of to bedlam to part way back she has a poem called for john who begs me not to inquire further <sighs> and i think that that poem i think is sort of about almost him i think saying that she was saying too much in her poems i think he was kind of saying in the beginning well this con this is really interesting and this is a really new thing to write about nobody's really written so blatantly about this before and then i think he was almost like well maybe you should kind of stop but i think that it goes with and i'll just read a little of it which is not that in the end it was beautiful but that in the end there was a certain sense of order there something worth learning in that narrow diary of my mind in the common places of the asylum where the cracked mirror or my own selfish death outstares me and if I tried to give you something else, something outside of myself, you would not know that the worst of anyone can be finally an accident of hope. So I think that there's a sort of weirdness of almost, I think one, she's both paying a homage to him. I think in the sense of like, well, actually this is almost a kind of accident of hope. And actually that she's been able to like, through poetry, been able to kind of organize her feelings and difficult things around kind of poetry and that's been a kind of channel for it but I think that it is kind of interesting that there is a sort of reticence which is I'm not sure if I can give you something else outside of myself and yet still moving on from there I mean I think mentorship in general I think is one of those weird things because you know in like there's a lot of mentorship programs for young poets in London and yeah, I think that when I was yeah. yeah I think when I was young I had mentorship things I don't think that they ever told me though anything that I really, I think that because I think that with the way poetry works now, it's almost all really accidental and a bit of a crap shoe. And I think a lot of identity things as to who gets picked up. I think that almost all mentors were just like, yeah, I mean, submit to these places. I already knew that those places were the places to submit to. I think that it's, I, I think that the role that the mentor has has probably changed quite a lot. Um, there's a poet who, I think I spoke about last time called Don Patterson. He, he was said that he was given the advice in the 80s, which is that you should plan your first published poem like an assassination. <laughs> and that's something, though, that would never happen now in terms of advice. This idea of you debuting in a big magazine as being an assassination, your piece that you're saying who you are to the world is not something that you're lucky that if I, you're lucky if anybody reads your poem in a magazine. Right. I think that the role in which the mentor takes, I guess, and like shaping your work and letting you be published, I guess, changes quite a lot. Yeah, I'm curious about that, because I think you're right about this, about how like, <laughs> the, the the role of a mentor, when it comes to writing and spe specifically poets, it's it's very different than what it was, even for, like 30, 40 years ago, you know, like, it's like, I always it did. <sighs> And I don't want to be because I had some pretty, pretty pivotal mentors in my life that helped me grow as a writer. So I don't want to like be like, oh, it's terrible. It's not worth it. But it's also like there is like this thing that like, like, uh, you know, I think about like uh, <clears throat> Brady Stanellis talks about this all the time, because, you know, where he went to Bennington in the 80s. And that was a very big program at the time for writers is kind of yeah. before MFAs exploded. So you could be an undergrad and do this. And they had great teachers there. And he said, you know, he got his first book published when he was like 19. And the reason that even the only reason that happened was because of his mentor, you know, like kind of said, wow, this is a pretty good manuscript. You know, let me send it to my agent, see what they think. Like, and that just doesn't happen anymore. Maybe it happens in some of the top five 
MFA programs or something. But I think that speaks to how the kind of relationship has shifted so dramatically in terms of mentorships. And I don't want to say it doesn't like exist anymore, but it doesn't exist at that level, like like where you're where you're I think that like I know that with Sexton with this book, that I think that a huge part of it being published was because John Holmes I think that there's stories about, I think, her sending multiple versions of the manuscript to him, them changing it around together. I think that his right. editorial prints were all over it. And so I think that that's something that is actually, yeah, significantly like, yeah, that's a significant difference in what we kind of have now. And I think that- um, And I wanted to she, ask you about that. Yeah. yeah. Just because I felt yeah. like when my experience <clears throat> with it, and not like, you know, not that I was like, oh, this great person or whatever in my in my MFA and stuff. But like, I was the only one of my cohort that had like a full book, like a full manuscript that I was turning in and working with during my thesis hours and stuff. Everybody else had like a partial book, maybe a chapbook length, or maybe like, you know, a couple different books smashed together because it's like a couple different years of work, different personalities and stuff. And I was, I remember always kind of thinking, be like, okay, like, what you know i need a little bit of guidance here and like it just wasn't coming with the kind of meetings yeah. and the thesis hours and stuff and i kind of being like you know, not disappointed but just kind of like okay like what do i do like like you you know like if it's like okay yeah this is working towards something you know I've, you can see what i'm trying to work towards here like i, I don't think know. It's so, it's, I, I had such a similar experience i mean i think that i did my mfa as a sort of touchstone to be able to get a PhD because I think that I knew that if I did the MA that would be a year and I and I then would it be able like what what my goal was with that was to be able to get the PhD money so then I would have three to four years to fuck around writing things now those years are coming to an end <laughs> and I'm like so scared <laughs> but I think that um I remember that with my cohort I think that only one of them is publishing at the moment right. and I think that a lot of them I think that I just remember having, I think that there are some classes where I'm like, okay, well, like, we're obviously at such clearly very different developmental stages. And I'm not sure actually, though, what, what, how can I be helped? Right. What is going to help me? And I think I wasn't really, yeah, I think I didn't know what steps to take. And I think that back then mentorship definitely meant something differently because I think that my mentorships of course, I'm incredibly grateful to, I think, like, I think a lot of when I was, I think that more so is I think that I was lucky that I got a lot of recognition when I was young through poetry competitions. And I think that that put me on a map. I think that um, after that, though, I think that when you're in this sort of middling level thing where, yeah, you have a manuscript, you've had poems in magazines, I think that that leap from that to, well, I'm going to have like, what, wh how, how am I going to like, do more now, I think is pretty difficult. Right. And he kind of like, I was searching for it, like kind of really like, like yearning for it. And like, maybe it's the political side of things where like, it's so bureaucratic now when you're, when you're working in like yeah. as a teacher in an MFA or a PhD, where like, if you tell students that like, this isn't good enough or something, there's like a whole like, you know, a bureaucratic apparatus that'll come down on your head for being too mean yeah. or whatever. Like I've had teach, I saw a teacher had this happen to them when I was at MFA. He was quote unquote too mean because he told people their work was bad when it was bad or it wasn't good enough, you know. I think uh, I find it I, something that, again, I'm very grateful with my student is that I can't be mean to her. <laughs> right. But, I do but that's, that's, that's the like, relationship. That's the mentorship. I mean, I think that yeah. also we're like, we're two. We're almost two hours deep in the pod, so I can bitch about this. Yeah, you, you have to be a real Sarah enjoyer to get to this level. But yeah, I think I was told also when I was teaching, to like at the university, to not call on students because they might have anxiety. And it's like, bitch, I have anxiety. What the fuck? And I, <laughs> it's like, I don't know. I'm getting up and I'm doing my thing. I don't understand. Like, I can do as much small group stuff if I want to learn, but I don't want to have a lesson where it's just like two assholes who've done the reading talking the entire time. Sorry that you, you, I think that you should be a little bit uncomfortable with right. the process. I think that also, like, what? I, how many times can I tell you, like, sorry, like, I do feel bad because there was one time where I'm like, look, there's no wrong answer to this. And then I think somebody did say the most wrong answer that could ever exist. <laughs> but I, just, I, I admit it. I'm like, you know what? That's wrong. I'm sorry. If, you, if anybody here in the class thinks that's right, just don't, that that's wrong. Sorry to put you up like this. But no, I always worry about being seen as too mean. 
Yeah, and it's interesting because I, you know, I was <clears throat> I had an undergrad teacher, and you know, this is even before you get to like the MFA kind of mentorship level where you have a whole book that you're working on, and she was so tough. Like she was so like she would <laughs> straight up tell me like like no, this isn't very good or like this isn't yeah. good enough, and it and I guess it depends on your disposition, but like I'm the type of person I know you probably are too, where like I actually get a lot of growth out of that when somebody I greatly respect tells me actually, you know, this isn't good enough. And it's not like they were being purpose. She was being purposely mean or anything like that. It was just literally trying to help me get better. And I, I, I did get a lot better because of her standing there and kind of over my shoulder being like, mm, no, 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 move this around a little bit. You're almost there, but look at what you're doing here. You know, yeah. like, like, and it I just, think, she was actually, tough and she had a reputation for it. Enough. Yeah in terms of actually the most help you get from mentors is I think that I had a weird example of like what you'd almost call a tiger mom mm -hmm. shout out Emily because I love you um and we're still like she still helps me with my poetry but I think that I remember when I was like 15 and my dad accidentally listened in on one of our like editing sessions and my dad went to my mom I think he was annoyed he was like Emily if anybody had ever said anything like that about my work I would never write again how are you saying this to our daughter? And then we both had to be like, wait, no, 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 no. This, like, this is actually really useful. And I think that we had lots of like actual arguments and fights during those sessions. Right. But I think actually she often would be like, Sarah, I'm saying this because I think that this is a good poem. Like this is like, but no, this line is crap. Or like, why don't you move with this? Or like, why did you say this? You said it because it sounds cool instead of it means right. anything. And actually I feel like that was way more helpful, I think, as an editorial process, where then I think that actually you have to really fight for what's happening in your poem. It means that you know exactly what's going on in it. You gain a new control over it. And I think that that was, I think, super invaluable to have that strangely from my mom. But I think that that was, I think, probably the most useful dynamic I've had in terms of editing. And it, I think, I think what, and you, what you're describing, I think, is that the relationship between Sexton and Holmes is the reason I wanted to ask you about it and stuff. Like, is because it is like, it, it is slightly adversarial, like in a way, like, and that's, that's normal. And I think it also that type of feedback and that type of direct, like, no, this isn't good enough, like, it separates the wheat from the chaff in a certain way. Like, it, it really does. It's just like, yeah. you know, it's hard to be a fucking writer. It's hard to write a good poem. It's hard to write a good novel. Like, it, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. And, and like, there's this sense that everybody has that like, all these great writers were just born super talented or something like no like they were shaped by somebody like Holmes in the early stages and then shaped by other people as they kind of grew into themselves and all of that like it's and if you can't yeah, handle that amazing. then you know there's plenty yeah. of other lines of work like <laughs> you well, know actually, find it. something that I think is interesting is that I was looking at earlier where did I put it here it is which is I think again it's um about looking at kind of first drafts and I think that there's um a few of Sexton's first drafts that I think that I can so see influence Sylvia Plath later on, or in some ways I would almost say became kind of cannibalized by Plath. So I think that this works with, again, in her first collection, there's a poem, Her Kind. And I think that there's this initial line, which I have here, which is the, the, the original ending was, those who see me here, this ragged apparition in their own air, see a wicked appetite if they dare, which for me has just such clear echoes with what is it? Out of the ash, I rise with my red hair and I eat men like er, the end of Lady Lazarus. I think that that's such a sort of um, just in terms of obviously the sound almost kind of plundered metrically right. that there's such similarities. But I think that also um, Plath and Sexton had a really interesting competitive relationship yeah. with their poetry as well. And I think that in that way, they both kind of spurred each other on. But I think that they both... Um, I think spoke about, again, I think both being, I, I, the word mentor would be wrong, but I think they both had a lot to learn from each other. And I think that you can see those sorts of competitive echoes, which can often be mean, I think actually yeah. become like very fruitful. I mean, we won't get to this poem probably in this um, podcast, but it's later in Live or Die where there's that poem, Sylvia's Death. Yes, I have can that marked as well, like, yeah. yeah such a crazy poem though every time i read it i'm like what an insane ass thing to write yeah like it's 
like it's like thief how did you crawl down into that death that i've wanted for so long i'm like oh my god like that's i think actually though one of the things where i guess when we opened this i was talking about how confessionalism often like you think of catholic confession there's a source of shame with that i'm like how like that is a thought that i imagine actually some people could have i mean i think that yeah. It's one of those dark things where it's like, I guess people who commit suicide get a lot of attention. And right. if you want attention, you're looking at that. That's a very, like, again, thing that we bury in us, that to write that and publish that using the name of your friend, I'm like, that's crazy. But I think that that's something that I find actually weirdly refreshing, even though it's very strange. Like, um, And that kind of attracts me to Plath. And uh, it's like... Sex thing and Plath. Yeah, and when, when you're getting that kind of like kind of mentorship feedback where it's almost like, yeah, like you said, almost mean or tough. There's like, mm. there's two types of people where there's like, yeah, there's the type of person that'll crawl into themselves and be like, Oh, well, I'm no good. I'm not going to do this anymore. And then there's the type of person that's just like, well, I'll fucking show you. <laughs> I'll fucking show you how to make, like, I'm yeah. going to do this, you know? I think that's like, well, one of my favorite stories, which is, I guess, kind of confessional adjacent, which is, oh damn, what's the name of this guy? Um, Donald Justice. Do you know Donald Justice? I do. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, John Berryman, I think, said something in a lesson where he's like, none of you students can write a good sonnet. Like, none of you will be able to write a sonnet that I think is perfect or good by the time of next lesson. And I think that then Donald Justice submitted The Wall, which is a famous sonnet. Do you know that one? Which yeah, is about yeah. the kind of lead. And I love that Very poem. Very canonized. So yeah, yeah. Um, well, interesting, because I think in the UK, nobody knows it. So I guess I think he's it's technically like, like American. American. Yeah, it's like American. But I think that that's something where I think that that's an answer, though, where there is a kind of call to competition, where I think Berryman was like, you won't be able to do this. And then at the end, he saw that and he's like, well, I guess I'm just going to eat my hat now. Like, right. that's yeah, that's actually a great sonnet. So um, as for the fruit, I had no taste at all. I think that, yeah, it's wonderful. And then you as a writer, you, you, you feel almost like it's almost like I don't want to say parenting relationship, but you do feel like good about that. And it kind of boosts your confidence when they challenge you when a mentor or somebody more experienced challenges you and then you reach, you, you kind of, you know, walk towards the challenge and achieve it and, and kind of even exceed their expectations. Like you kind of feel like, you know, uh, like a proud child or something. Yeah. Like my parents are proud of me or something. Cause you did. Well, you, you haven't know. been on this. So it's interesting because as I've got older and I'm teaching more, have you felt like you've been on the side of being the mentor? Cause um, I think that's so that I found weird is that I think that I've always been the mentee. Um, and I think that actually I've almost had this experience with the student that I'm working with now being like, okay, damn that. Yeah. You rose to that challenge. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like I think that um, I was teaching sonnets, sonnets last week and I was teaching a lot about how, you know, how the sonnet has a kind of argument, it has a kind of statement, complicating factor, and then the Volta. I said, I want you to take this and write a sonnet using the argument in reverse. So you kind of make the opposite argument. She did that. And then I'm like, cool, this is a Shakespearean sonnet. Translate it into a Petrarchan sonnet, just with the same vibes. And she did that. And I'm like, OK, you can't, you're, you're acing my test too easily. I'm very impressed. Yeah. And I think that that's a, I can see, I've been the kind of swarmy child who's felt like the sort of, I think I've spent a long time being the ingenue who's very excited by that. And now it's very weird to be in the position of like, the proud parent. I think you're right. There's a sort of maternal or paternal thing. I think usually more paternal. I think maybe I feel more paternal than maternal to my students um, that you kind of take on in sort of forging that um, creativity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's great. I've really, in my capacity teaching, I have never really been given an opportunity to be a mentor in that sense, at least in terms of like my actual expertise. Because I just, they teach, like I just teach 101, 102 for the most part. It's a, uh, I don't really get any type of workshops or anything like that. I mean, I would love that opportunity. Yeah, I always say like if anybody, <laughs> if they're trying to enhance a creative writing program, I was like, I'll happily take that on. Uh, I'll literally, I'll like, well, I'll be like within my leadership, it would be turned around within five years or whatever. Yeah, it would be respectable. Like, it should be hit up. So yeah, exactly. If anything, do the podcast now. Yeah, <laughs> like absolutely. There would be a very strict kind of, yeah, it's funny because I think that the, where I'm working now is that I work mostly with American students um, who are usually doing their year abroad in the UK. And I think that what they bring is very different than what British students bring. I think British students are much more 
nervous about writing. I think in some ways, American students, I think I can almost feel, even with undergrads, the influence of the sort of MFA industrial complex. So I think that I'm shocked by, they all, I mean, the worst of it is like the horrible Ocean of Young impersonators. Right, yeah. I think that's also because they they are somehow like smart type A kids who've learned how to impersonate that voice and know that that's the popular voice right. and can do it kind of creepily well. That's not a horrible situation to have on my hands. I think that then it's like, okay, well, you've been able to imitate that. Let's start doing parodies of the metaphysicals then just to see what happens. But yeah. I think that, yeah, I think that I, I think that you and me would have a very good creative writing program together. Absolutely. You hear that out there, everybody listening. Yeah. You need to, uh, if you're trying to uh, expand an MFA, although I guess the expansion's pretty much over at this point. That was like a Gen X thing, but uh where everybody was just getting jobs, like running these MFA programs for a while there. But uh... I mean, it is one of those like vague, I think it's interesting when we talk about mentorship, where I do think that in some ways, some MFAs have had a kind of pyramid scheme quality, where I think that a lot of it is to make writers be employed. Right. People who are essentially good writers, publish a lot, make a university look good. And then I think their role is to sort of, it's a way of keeping them kind of adjacent to academia and making sure they have a job so they have time to write. And I think that that's been, I think, a lot of kind of part of the disappointment with MFAs is that I think that in that way, they've often, yeah, been kind of a pyramid scheme, which is, I think, is they're not as big of a thing in the UK, I feel is not as controversial to say, but I think in America, it seems like people really feel like they have to get one. Yeah, because... Yeah, and I've I've been thinking a lot about like the kind of the stigmas around self publishing and stuff too, particularly with like these kind of you're so dependent on these programs and these universities, and then you have the people that are running these places that are either you know they were good at one point but they're checked out now because they've had this kind of you know tenured job for decades and decades. Yeah. But also, yeah, I mean, there was that you know for a while there it was like Iowa and like five other people in five other schools in the U.S. that had these kind of you know oh you go here if you're a big writer. I already mentioned Brady Stanellis and kind of Bennington, which isn't even an MFA. Although I think they have an MFA now. That was like you just went to a prestigious undergrad school with like prestigious, like good teachers and stuff. And it was hard to get into. And then like in like the eighties and nineties, there was this boom in the U S of just like this kind of flood of every school, every big kind of state school was starting a creative writing kind of arts program like yeah. that. And they were just hiring everybody because they needed teachers, you know, so people with like one book or something were getting hired in these positions. And then, yeah. What's your on? So I, was, I was bitching about this. I was talking to my mom and dad, essentially ha having like, this is about a month ago. A month ago when I was in more meltdown mode about poetry things. And I was like, they're like, well, so you don't need to publish with people who have like X and Y beliefs. And I'm like, you don't understand. It's everybody. Yeah. It's everything. <laughs> like, no, like, I'm like, it's not like, it's not like I can get away from it. It's like, it's everything. Yeah. And I think that... Um, they suggested, which I didn't think the film was that good, but have you seen the film American Fiction? I haven't seen it yet, no, but I know the gist of it because everybody You know was... the kind of plot of it. I think yeah. that, um, uneven film, but I think that um, I was intrigued that, yeah, I think it does say a decent amount about, I think that there are bits of it where I think I watched it with my mom and she was like, this is funny. And I'm like, this is funny. For me, this is like way too real. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I wish I was distanced enough to laugh at like, but this is what the conversations are like. Like, I think that a lot of the conversations are really condescending and identity. But like, of course, like, I, I think that I often think um, what my career could be like or look like if I lent into different aspects of my like things like that more. But right. sorry that I'm smart. Like, I don't know. It's just right. really frustrating. That, we're sorry um, that i love poetry too much to like yeah exactly. degrade it's myself. Like, also, yeah. Like, also it's like if you don't think i'm talking about some of those things i guess like you just can't fucking read because i am talking a lot about right being a woman in some ways like but just not in a gay way so i don't know just like it's not it's not the most interesting thing about me but it obviously it's going to bleed through my poetry also i don't mean gay is a prerogative uh, as a bad thing, <laughs> just, i'm like slightly concerned that i'm i don't I, n I never want to edge lord too close to the sun. It's a very right. good ge it's a hard game to play, but I think podcasts bring it out. Yeah, it's just, yeah. I mean, trust me. Like, I think I've alienated enough people in that that world yeah, that they're I not even that listening. That's <laughs> gone down so much. I think that <laughs> I think I used to have a really genuine fear 
of being canceled, like in a real, like it would keep me up way. Right. Yeah. And Especially I, when you're putting used, out creative work, like, yeah. It used to really bother me. And I think I found out, like, I've heard various things through the grapevine about me that are just like not even true about like what my possible political beliefs could be or things like that. But it was very weird. I think I was like once in Spain and I was talking to this guy who was a poet who was there and he was like, yeah, well, you know, I was, I wanted to publish you here, but someone said that you're a turf. And I was like, <laughs> well, like, what? but I was like, okay, one, it's really funny to hear two guys being like, we're not going to publish a woman because of that. But anyway, I was like, why do they think that? And I guess it's because I follow someone on Twitter who they right. think is a turf. Exactly. Yeah. And I was like, so this is very weird because a conversation behind my back has happened. None of you guys know me. You've just met me tonight. You guys are poetry editors. You don't know who I am. And I only tweet like what? Like I tweet like poetry. I, I mostly tweet like just poetry things that I like and the occasional joke and like a cute outfit. And that like based on the fact that I follow someone, like loads of people during the Trump presidency followed Trump because that was a way of keeping up with the news. Like right. it felt very weird to be like, so some weird backroom conversation has happened in which it's been decided that somehow I have these beliefs that I don't even have and is based on something as innocuous as a Twitter follow. And I think that this is the sort of thing where I was complaining to my parents about it, where I was like, yeah, I don't know. I was like, yeah, this like w the, the landscape is very different now. And I think that in some ways, I think that the better thing to do is I just think that I care less about yeah. pandering. To that. It's like, OK, if, if I'm going to be if I'm going to be in trouble for something as innocuous as a who I follow on Twitter, then I just don't give a fuck. Right. <laughs> so and that's what really I can. Yeah. And that's what really gets under my skin about it is that when they're talking about that we are no longer talking about poetry we're talking about something else like you know like they're talking about this kind of vague political morality thing and they're not talking yeah. about the art they're not talking about what's there what was actually written what was actually said it's about this kind of very generalized vague thing that they just refer to there it's was a big either. scandal uh here it's in funny. america at least in the poetry you know the small little insular poetry world and it was even, it was a small press. There was a girl, uh, Emily Russo. I tried to get her on the podcast, but I think by the time I had emailed her, she had kind of been dragged through the trenches so much. She was like, I'm not speaking publicly or anything. Like she didn't respond, but like it has what happened to her is, is she had a book contract for a small press to have her book out. And she said, she just got an email out of the blue that said, Oh, all of a sudden we can't do this anymore. Papers have already been signed like with the contract and stuff. And they didn't really tell her why, but you know why it was. It was because of things like that. Like, oh, we didn't like who you follow on Twitter, or you had a reading with this person who we don't like, or anything like that. It's this very strange guilt by association. And then when she tried to defend herself a little bit about it, of course she got her head bitten off, you know, by well, like this these... Is, you apologize, it gets worse. Like, yeah. do you know... Because this bled into American things. Did you hear about Toby Martinez de las Rivas? No, no. So he's a friend. So he's a friend of mine. I almost feel, but I, do, I don't even want to talk about it too much in case like it, because he feels like he, because I remember at the time. So essentially he wrote a book called Black Sun and it's an incredibly beautiful book. I think that it has a hilariously sneery poem about the metropolitan elites in London. I think that he's really, but he's mostly a religious poet. It's mostly about his kind of thinking about um, he's working in this very like religious metaphysical tradition and he's incredibly well read. And I think that black sun there is used as obviously the famous kind of motif of um, like the kind of revelations when the final judgment comes. I think also Chris Staber wrote a book about black sun, about her depression. Anyway, he wrote, he got a poem in Poetry Foundation and he was accused of being a fucking Nazi. Right. And I think that it's so interesting. I think when you think about cancer, like it really, like he, um, I don't think he'd mind me saying this, which is I think that in terms of canceling, what it looks like for celebrities is like they have money. I think that we are, as poets are working kind of, he's like suddenly university jobs or like judges, like people don't want, people don't want me to judge poetry competitions. Right. People don't want university jobs. You're making 14k a year. He has two daughters, right. and he was like, "That's something where like being canceled for what? Like he he is not even right wing." I think when I met him, I was drunk, and I was like, "Hey, do you want to like? Are you actually a conservative?" And he was like annoyed. He was like, "No, I'm not. Right. This is like the weirdest thing to he's ever an have artist. happened." Yeah, he's an artist. Of course, he <laughs> I think like... he's, really, <laughs> yeah. he's really smart. But I think that I thought that that was very. Um, 
I think that after that, I think I said to him when I met him in real life, I was like, well, do you wish people, because at the time I was like, did I, I didn't say, I, I don't know if I said enough. I think that I, I liked things that were more on his side, but also I was afraid of being canceled. And he was like, no, I wouldn't want what happened to me to happen to anyone. Right. And I think that he's like, what they want you to do is that they want you to, I think that like, it's, it's kind of crazy where this sounds dramatic, but I feel like they want you to kill yourself or something. Like they really don't want, like, yeah. I think that it is actually very dystopian. And I don't think that, um, I think that again, with the, the person you've said, once you apologize, it makes it way worse. I think that apologizing means that you're kind of almost getting to that sort of level. And I think that what I find frustrating is that again, it's not done in good faith of art. Like, it's a I hatred that, of yeah. art. Yeah, I call it a hatred. It, it's, it's, people it's, like, yeah, yeah, I think, no, I completely agree. And I think that it's a sort of like, well, because I've been really into and reading much more, but I've always been into him. But do you know Frederick Steedle? Uh, yeah, you mentioned him last time and I was looking things up because of it. Yeah, so I think that, well, Robert Lowell chose one of his books um, as a part of a competition. Hilarious, well, hilariously, in bad taste, his first poetry book was called The Final Solution. <laughs> um, I think that, but I think that all of his poems are like these rhymy poems about being like a rich guy in New York with like a young girlfriend with shaved pubes right. and like bad taste. But I think that in some ways I actually really appreciate that more so than I think poets who I think kind of intimate a working class background that they might not actually have or this sort of thing where it's like, okay, if this guy is a talented poet and his real life is just him going around being a sugar daddy and like have it and like listen like I guess reading Proust and being a sugar daddy then I feel like that's at least more real and I like that much more than um like I don't know I kind of respect that swagger and of, like, I think you mentioned this like, yeah, a rich fucker yeah and I think you mentioned this last time where you talk about how like in terms of how uptight at least culturally and this is overseas too this is between continents at this point because of social media it's kind of a global culture in the arts like to be rebellious in this kind of very uptight kind of Puritan culture that we're living through, like that's one way to be rebellious is to just be like, oh no, fuck that. Like actually, yeah, like I'm an yeah. old pervy old man that just like likes to fuck women that are way too young for me, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And I don't care about relationships or blah, blah, blah. Like it's like an act of rebellion and it's such an, it's so small, an act of rebellion too. Like that's the worst part is that like, you're not even, it's not even yeah. like a huge rebellion in this sense or we wouldn't even have batted an eye about it like 10, 15 years ago. But now all of a sudden it's this huge deal because of this Puritan kind of, yeah. again, something vague morality. Think, it's this not, cause it's not it's about poetry. Like something, that, something that I've become again. So I guess I feel bad because we're getting so off track, but I'm having a lot of fun, which yeah. is like something that I'm so interested in is I think like, I think it's a lot of Gen X. So I'm obviously, because I'm a woman, I follow a lot of stupid gossip shit, like for celebrities. And so I guess if you don't know, Ariana Grande had an affair and like, she, I guess like she cheated on her husband and is with this new guy now. Anyway, on the gossip forums, people are like, I can't even like look at, there's this huge moralism about it, right. which is just like, like, well, what do you think most, like, I don't know. I think like people refuse to engage with like certain sorts of art because they're canceling someone for like cheating right like cheating sucks i'm like not gonna go out but also it's like we don't know these people we don't know any of their situation i think generally infidelity happens in incredibly complex circumstances we right. don't really know what's happening but to make it so somebody's like well like i can't even listen to this person's music anymore because they cheated on their wife and it's yeah. like well that sounds okay well i have a bad thing to tell you about almost every musician ever or like, like, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's so weird though to see the sort of, what makes us uncomfortable about an artist went from sort of moral things, right? We don't want to listen to a racist or we don't want to listen to a sexist, which those are things that I can empathize with more. Just suddenly like, I don't want to listen to somebody who cheats on their partner right? or something like that. And it's kind of like, I don't know. I just find that really, um, myopic and strange and again these are all the same people who are like i love Anne sexton or like i'm a like a literary it girl sort of right. thing and it's like dude i have some bad things to tell you about Anne sexton 
And it's, you're, gonna, you're, you're about to be really disappointed. And most importantly, it's not about the art. It's about something else. And they're using it as a proxy to dismiss yeah. great works of art or great artists and things like that. Like I always say, this, like they use that stupid phrase, separating the art from the artist, which I always thought was a terrible defense for people that yeah. were like on our side that were trying to get people to stop doing this. And I was like, it's a terrible defense because the people that are saying these things that you shouldn't read this certain artist or like this certain artist, they're also doing that. They are separating the artist from the art where they're yeah. talking only about the artist and not the art. So like, it's not a defense. Like you should just tell these people, fuck you. Like, because... Like I the, wonder also then if there's this idea though of everybody because with the confessionals we're talking about this idea of writing personally. Yeah. I wonder do you think that there's been a correlation between people writing personally and then people taking it personally? Absolutely. I mean, I wonder if because I think that now so much of how we kind of write is sort of again just vouched in this idea of writing from personality or writing from personal experience. I think that is much more writing again, as I said earlier, as a form of expression. So if we're going to write personally, I guess people will take it personally, which I think is obviously not good. But I just wonder if that's a kind of inevitable consequence of having that sort of writing. Yeah, I think that's very true. I think it is like there's this because confessional is the thing and even everything. So memoir, autofiction, all of this, it's all confessional in the fiction, nonfiction, poetry realms, all the literary and even a lot of the like filmmaking and shit is now like confessional and bullshit. And it's like because of that when somebody does I criticize it that's true detective reboot oh god yeah i did a whole piece actually on the, i feel like uh, i know uh, i feel like that's like a different that's probably a different topic but i think that even that was someone where it's like are you really this is where we are now yeah i thought it like, was horrible yeah i did a big oh, no. thing on it for but the like, pod yeah. more, i think that i yeah i got more and more horrible in a way that it was almost like i'm surprised that this was allowed to be made yeah. Or like I just, like like shockingly bad, especially um, for I, HBO, where like everybody knows HBO's reputation is quality. Like you go there for high quality kind of shows and TV and movies and stuff. Like, yeah. like an example of something that I think people took personally, but I think was written personally is I think that I'm a fan of Girls, oh, yeah. which was on HBO. I think that Girls actually stands up, and actually that has a very funny scene where have you have you watched Girls? Oh yeah, I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, because she goes to Iowa in it, and there's oh, yeah. this sort of, it's also about her sort of weird relationships with her sort of um, creative writing teacher and also the people who are in her cohort. But I think that that's something where I think that I can, I think that I wonder if it's just sort of implicitly tying, like, I don't know, I think that it's the kind of a horrible bastardization of the phrase, like, the personal is political, Yeah. where suddenly I think that if you believe that the personal is political, then everything you experience has not only poetic grandeur, but societal grandeur, in which what happens to you is something that is suddenly, something that is kind of worth being put on a sort of significant altar of either microaggressions or something else. And I think, um, I think that it, yeah, I don't know. It's, well, I think also something that I like about Sexton is that I think it's also made poetry a lot less fun. Yes. And I do yeah. think that there's an element in some ways, again, we're talking about her glamour and flirtation of, I think, fun. Like something that actually I did want to bring up, which is, did you know Anne Sexton had a rock band? No. So this is so funny because I actually covered one of the songs that she did, I think when I was 20, at a poetry reading, so I and I have written down next to it. It's the song um, "Music." It's the poem "Music Swims Back to Me," which is, um, I think, one of the, it's the fourth poem in her, the first collection. And I think I have written next to it. I think from when I was eighteen, the chords that go with it. So she was in a band called Anne Sexton and Her Kind, which was mostly her just doing sort of weird spoken word things but her version of this it's quite hard to find recordings online i bet i can find one though to show you later it sounds essentially like cool proto patty smith where she's like reading and shouting this poetry over guitar stuff and there's actually quite a few of the um like poems from this collection that ended up kind of being put into her kind of weird jazzy poetry rock band which i thought was kind of funny because i think that i kind of forgot that existed and i was looking because i think that i have on a lot of the poems when i was a kid i have a lot of a b a c kind of because i'm thinking about the rhymes and then i'm looking at this and i'm like a minor 
Right. Wait, yeah. Oh my God, this is a song. That's why it's there. It's not the rhyme at all. And I think that, um, I think that there's an element of, again, while she, I think, works with quite serious material, I think that there's still this sort of playfulness that I think is often kind of, I don't know, killed now. Yeah. I, 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 cause, okay, because it's not about the art. It's about this other thing, this vague other yeah. thing that kind of, it, it like it used to be so much fun. It used to be cool. But now to be cool is to be a part of this vague kind of moral blob that kind of keeps changing daily and blah, 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 and all that kind of shit. I'm just like, Jesus. Yeah. I but think I then... said this last time, but I think it's like the death of real subculture where I think that like hipster and emo were the last kind of cohesive subcultures. But I think that we live in a segmented world where I think that things like cutting your hair, should, like I think that stylistic things that there's no real music there's no real fashion look but it's almost like the bands that they all like right. they're like the kind of movement is like this sort of moralism and i find that kind of crazy because i think that I, it makes me feel happy that i've been so happy because courtney love has been in the news a lot recently for being uh, mean about taylor swift um who has her tortured poets department album coming out all right um, but i think that it is one of those things where i'm happy that at least i was like 16 and i decided to just get into wearing fishnet tights and like weird ripped lace dresses and being scary in that way instead of deciding to just become and also back then i was a huge feminist and i think that well i don't really use that label now obviously i think my impulses are towards i think a lot of second wave feminism where i'm like yeah. obviously i don't just say that i'm not um just in terms of just how i live my life but i think that um I'm happy that I never had this, yeah, it's this sort of huge moralistic impulse where I think that the rules are always changing and you can never be, it's, I think like, yeah, you say jump, I say how high. And I think that how high it is, is always going to be kind of straining against reality. Yeah. And even Damn, I'm then, getting like, more strength here in this one than the last one, I think. No, I, I think mean, this is great. <laughs> yeah. And, and even like when you mentioned Dunham too, like I think, that that is like kind of a confessional where I think it's like the seminal yeah. millennial work of girls where it captures our generation better than anything else did. And like, I think even the criticisms that she got for that, because it was, I think it really kind of hurt her in a way where she didn't really do yeah. much after that and whatever she didn't have to, you know, but like, I'm sure like it kind of really affected her in a way where she wasn't putting out as much work like it took her years oh. to get her next project out and things and it was just kind of like i'm sure that that people criticizing it saying that it was like you know all with these kind of moralistic kind of frameworks that are all the rage now like like really hurt the creative process and it, it kept her from being as honest and yeah. stuff so like when you're not being as honest when you're doing this kind of shit of course it's not going to be as good and like it's interesting. So a, a bloke friend of mine who's a novelist, he got a blurb from Lena Dunham for his novel. And I think it's interesting. So he is very, he's a very, the, the novel was a very masculine novel. He's a very stereotypically masculine guy. And I think that they asked me when I was doing my poetry book, if I also would want a blurb from Lena Dunham. And I was like, well, in some ways I really like her, but I was kind of like, I feel like that would just hurt me. It made sense for him because I think that he's writing this kind of big dick novel right. where like, it's just like like totally different but i think that if i i feel like it's a shame that i feel like she's almost kind of becomes this sort of weird double-edged sword which i think is sort of um yeah i didn't feel i i was like look i want to get the most famous people i can i have chris kraus and things like that but i actually feel like this would be something that would get me weirdly more in trouble than it would get i mean i think it's interesting i feel like women and minorities often get canceled more than men. Yeah. Uh, I think that if you look at in the UK, speakers who've been no platformed at universities, I think it disproportionately affects women speakers as well. So I think that it's interesting how sort of these old moralistic um, kind of things play out, even within that woke atmosphere of who yeah. is and isn't allowed to talk. Yeah, it's in, I know. And it's, I think Dunham doesn't get enough credit for this either, where she is very much aware of the literary world, the artistic world. She blurbed uh, this American Poets books, and this was a couple of years ago, uh, uh, Khaki Wilkinson's uh, The Winona Stone Poems. It's, no, I don't uh, know that. You, you'd like Khaki Wilkinson. She's... Uh, I, she's great. She's and she writes very kind of metered and rhymed stuff, but like in contemporary sense, it's very good. 
but like and then she has this blurb from fucking lena dunham on the front of the book and it's kind of like oh yeah like lena dunham is blurbing poetry like like, like she knows well, I feel like, like lena dunham is smart and actually reads things exactly yeah like exactly. i think also yeah. like i think that what i think is interesting is so i rewatched girls i think about two years ago so i watched it when it came out and i think i was like 17 or 18 when it came out but i think that i remember um it's way more, I think that I mean, she's very self-aware. The entire series is incredibly yeah. self-aware. It's like every time that I, I think people also, I think again with media literacy are unable to tell when people are being sarcastic or when they're making jokes at themselves. I think that this idea also, I think it's funny that everybody in girls hates Hannah. Right. I think she's pretty much one of the more likable of the girls. Yeah. I think that I, I would go for a drink with her and hang out with her. I think that it's kind of um, amusing. And also this is like, my own sort of maybe more hot take with this, which is that I think that I feel like a lot of people just genuinely, they don't want to admit it, but part of why they found her so repulsive is because she was fat and not super yeah. sexy. Yeah. Like, I think that actually, like, it's actually funny, this almost dovetails in with things that we owe to Sexton, which is that Sexton was very shameless about menstruation or about like these sorts of like very feminine topics that in some ways could be seen as ugly. And I think that, um, she's really gorgeous, which we've kind of said that's part of her poetry. And I do think, what does it mean to kind of be exploring almost similar topics as somebody who doesn't have that sort of insane initial Hollywood allure? Yeah. And I think, that, um, I guess in some ways that does make me think that in some ways, do we have a long way to go? I don't know. Right. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a hundred percent where she got a lot of that shit for being kind of the fat girl that was doing it anyway. Like, uh, and like, I think like, oh, you're not like, allowed to. Yeah, like. Like, there's this one episode where I think she just, like, fucks this hot doctor. And everyone is like, well, that's not realistic. She just painted herself into this. And I'm like, guys, I have a really disappointing fact to tell you about guys. Yeah. <laughs> like, have, like, guys are fucking pretty much everything that they can. Right. This is totally realistic that this would happen. I think that, um, I'm sorry that, like, I guess it upset you to watch that on TV, but... It doesn't, there's nothing here that's really sending my, like, oh, no, that's not going to work. Me, like, that's unrealistic meter off. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And like I said, it's it's the millennial anthem. If anything has come close to kind of capturing our generation in, in a very accurate way, in a funny way, too, like, they're making it good. Like, it was that show, Girls and Lena Dunham's kind of, show running and writing and directing of that and acting obviously because she's the most one of the stars but uh, i think it's crazy there's this screen test of her and adam driver and made his career that's made his whole career i know yeah. and i think that and he ad-libs a lot of the i think it is so interesting how <laughs> the original when you watch the first season adam driver's i wouldn't say it, like physical comedy isn't the word but his physicality is actually is one of those like whoa it's almost like again not not akin in terms of sexuality, but maybe in terms of just acting in this sort of way. I think that is almost like Marlon Brando's streetcar, where when you mm -hmm. watch him acting in this sort of, in, he is just like, he, he is the kind of like, I think it's interesting that I think that in Girls, I'm interested in the girls, but I think that Ray and Adam, the male characters, end up being some of the best written on the show. Yeah. And their actors really use a lot to kind of bring something to them. Absolutely, yeah. Like I said, I mean, Driver's entire career was because of that, his character on that show, like, and now he's, like, getting nominated for Oscars and shit, like. And was, like, in Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, like, so funny. I wonder if he thought it was, because, you know, Adam Driver, I've actually weirdly looked at him as part of my PhD, because that he was, I guess, in, was he in combat? Yeah, he was an ex-military. Yeah, he yeah. was in combat. And so I think that he did an acting work with veterans where they, like, all did this kind of Greek play that was about, I think, what was the Greek play? I don't remember the name. It was about a man who'd, like, lost his foot in battle. And essentially, like, the foot started to smell really bad and everybody was arguing about whether to leave him behind. And he staged this sort of, like, before a girl, sort of, like, performance of it just for the veterans in terms of helping them process their trauma. So right. I think that he actually, like reading that paper, it made me think that he's probably much more of an intellectual that we think, which makes me wonder what he was thinking with the sort of Star Wars sorts of, like obviously clear cash grab, but like what right. those roots, like what is the thought process there? 
Yeah, probably because he was just a fan and like he probably got that offer and was like, of course, like, yeah. And like, yeah, the money, I'm sure, was good. But uh, did you like Star Wars when you were a kid? I loved it. Yeah. And my parents yeah. are boomers, so they were big into it. Like my dad was a big Star Wars guy. Uh, like when they did the 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 prequels in the early 2000s, late 90s, like we saw all of those, like, you know, whole family in the theater when I was a kid. But like the sequels, like the they were so bad. Like I mean, even the prequels, I don't think were very good. But like the just this. The, oh no, I agree. The driver I ones I, are not good. Yeah, I was obsessed with. I think this is when I was like nine. I was obsessed with Princess Leia, and I think we went to some kind of Star Wars museum, and there was a huge life size cutout of Princess Leia, and I'm nine and I want it. Right. It's her in her slave girl costume yeah. with Jabba the Hutt. So obviously, like, it's meant for, like, horny guys. And I think that at the time, my dad was like, maybe we could find you another one somewhere else or like that. But I was just like, I just want Princess Leia in my room. I right. loved it. I had, I think that I, I, I had no idea of these kind of sexual implications either. Right. So I think that my parents had to raise me as a nine-year-old with a life-size, huge Carrie Fisher cutout of, like, sexy Princess Leia just, like, right next to me, next to the bed where Absolutely. I was sleeping in. So, um, and now I grew up and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's ridiculous, but. Yeah. But I mean, that's, I, I think it, so much of it, it's same thing with this kind of cancel stuff. Like it's a projection into people that like, it's like, oh, well, if you wrote this, you must've been thinking about this. It's like, no, 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 you're projecting this shit onto the work of art or something. Yeah. Or like you're projecting the sexualized nature of adulthood onto a, you know, a child that just likes the fact that this girl is kind of a princess and like, you know, and like badass and everything yeah, like and that. strangles the guy to death with the chains that she was being. Well, like, that's the thing. In. Also, she doesn't like being in the costume. She kills Jabba the Hutt and gets yeah. out. Like she's very. I, I'm a huge Carrie Fisher fan in general. Um, someone who likes Sexton also had bipolar disorder. I mean, who knows what Sexton really had? But I think um, um, Carrie Fisher's own writing, I think, is actually pretty good on that right. in a surprising way. You wouldn't expect that from a celebrity. Yeah. Also, I just love that she randomly married Paul Simon. Like, what? That's so rare. I, I, like, forget that. So it's like, what? Like, you took so much coke that John Belushi was scared, and then you just go off and marry Paul Simon? Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. Well, you know, artists, they are, they're drawn to one another in that sense. Yeah. Well, I think I'm just very against adultery, so I guess I'll never <laughs> know more about it. <laughs> Stupid. All right, I gotta uh, take a piss real quick. We take a quick break, yeah, and then you, uh, as well. Perfect. And then we I move know, on I to the first book. Even... Yeah, that's ideal. It's been like an hour and a half almost. It's amazing. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So, that's cool. how I figured well, getting... this was gonna happen. Yeah. No, I know. Me too. I think that, like, honestly, I always have so I, I had so much fun last time, so I'm not surprised. Right. But yeah, I... I, I'll piss as well, and then we can come back. Yeah, for sure. Yay! Perfect. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. No, ideal. That was good timing. I think that um, I'm unsurprised, but I think that I also was like, oh my God, it's been two hours and a half. And we have like, we've cracked into a lot of the Sexton lore. And I think that, um, oh man, I'm so tempted to make some horrible joke about like the lore, L-U-R-E, and the kind of alluringness of Anne Sexton in general. But I think that there's very much um, that. So yeah, we should crack into the first book because otherwise I feel like we'll never get it done. So Well, that's what I figured. Take me back whenever you want because honestly, I feel like... Yeah, I, I figured we'd so try to do this like since we're going through it like every couple weeks or so, we could try to get fine. this. I yeah. that like, really works. I think that now that I have my own place, my schedule is a lot easier to work with. I think that I was really in... What is it like they say online? I was in like goblin mode for a while <laughs> and I think that now I feel much more chilled out so I think that my schedule is a lot easier so I think that that works really well that's what I that's when I messaged you what I was like because I was reading through and I got to like kind of one I realized that like the, that uh, the fourth book that we would be reading for this if we did like for the first four kind of cuts into the like it's like 230 pages or something if we went all the yeah, way with so that the, one the first two, so for me I think that the best thing to do for this episode is that I think that the first two books are interesting. We can work with them. We'll see yeah. how we get through the first one. Because I think that um, the real pivotal kind of change in Sexton is in her third book, which is Live or Die, which right. is the one that she 
who lives there for. And I think that that is a kind of big stylistic break from the first two that then leads very nicely into love poems. And then we get to transformations, the kind right. of fairy tale stuff. So I think that um, it's actually also really interesting to look at the kind of history of how Live or Die became chosen for the Pulitzer because it was against, I think, Ariel at the time and a few things. And it was one of those things where I think if you listen to the judges, it is a sort of weird process of elimination right. as to how it got there. But I do think it's a wonderful collection. And I do feel like that sort of, yeah, an interesting space to kind of perhaps resume on Sexton. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That's why I just messaged you. It was like, shit. I know, like, last time Sarah and I taught, like, I was like, we're going to be going, like, especially as we get into this first book. Like, I'm like, shit, if we even get to, like, the second book here, <laughs> like, I'd be like, surprised. I know, well, you said 200 pages, and then I'm like, you know what? This is a fucking lot of sex. That's what I was thinking, yeah. So much stuff that I want to say. As I was actually, like, reading it and preparing it and taking notes, I was like, oh, shit. Like, we're going to be talking. So I was like, whatever, yeah, if you're down to make it, like, however many parts <laughs> it takes to get I through. Yeah. I think yeah, every few weeks I'm happy to come on. Yeah. I love podcasting as a form so much that I'm going to just like, we can even cut this out. Should I start a podcast or is that going to be so cliche of me? I say everybody should. Uh, it's definitely like, I, I mean, I'm very anal. That's the only reason I can kind of get away with it is because I plan everything out, you know, <laughs> very, uh, it's easy to burn out. Like I started this with a co-host and like yeah. she got very burned out like after like a year of doing it i think i probably would not want to fuck with the co-host because i feel like i'm pretty much a control freak with stuff and i yeah, think that same. i would want to have my own sort of controlling of things so i don't know but i think that i've been enjoying listening to yours so it's it's, it's been it's been a worm that's been in my brain so we'll see yeah, I mean, I started it just because, like, there were no others. Like, I would get so frustrated. Like, when I, I mean, there's plenty of them out there, but they were not, they were all afraid to touch the topics that we just spent two hours yeah. talking about and stuff. They were all afraid to touch that. And I went on a different podcast. It's like a poetry podcast here in the States. They had me on as a guest, whatever. And we talked about a lot of things. But I remember, like, the, the reaction to me and the things I was saying about kind of directly against, you know, wokeness and that kind of yeah. shit. Like, their audience was furious with me, you know, like literally, you know. Interesting. Yeah. And I do think that it's intriguing because I feel like one of the worst forms in which to kind of have conversations about the sort of struggles that, again, I guess if we use wokeness as a phrase for an ideology, I think that the, the, the conversations about it mostly happen on the arena of Twitter, exactly. which is through tweets. And I don't think that that's the most productive way of talking about how it impacts art. I think it's through long form conversations exactly. that these things really are able to like, you can tease it out. And I think that of course, if you tweet something that's going to be like, not very good. And or it's gonna somehow stoke kind of issues. So I think that- And when I was on it, like- Things I like. When I was on it, you know, the host was very nice. Like it was fine. Like, you know, he wasn't like jumping down my throat or anything, but I could tell like just sometimes when I, they would just be this kind of knee jerk, like when I would say something or like, you know, break something down as to why I don't like it or, or the, or the, the wokeness problem. There was just kind of this, I could see, I could just sense it through the fucking screen that there was like a fear that went up through his chest, you know, like kind of like he knew his audience was going to react well, to this I in a way. You know, what I find though, is that usually with academics, when I talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, Usually, everybody in real life is pretty chill. I think right. it's almost yeah. having this sort of arena that makes people like this. Because I think that I don't feel like any of my friends, who I think are of a much more kind of, I don't know, gold star woke standard than me. I think in real life, none of them have issues with kind of how I present myself or any of my views or what I say. Right. But I think it's very weird that once you kind of have that, there's this sort of almost surveillance element, which is that once it's sort of for consumption there's a sort of anxiety around it. And it's kind of like, yeah, you can see those knee jerk reactions, which sort of come from, yeah, what is acceptable and what is not. So that's why I've always appreciated your podcast in general, but also being a guest. Yeah, of course. And I'm glad to hear that too, because yeah, one, I think we have great conversations and two, I just think I'm just tired of it. Like, I don't want to have to do this fucking tiptoe. It's like, no, we're going to say it. We're going to say that this is bad. Like, <laughs> The only complaint that I have is I think that you should just release it as a video because we'd get more views. That's true. Yeah. Especially on the <laughs> YouTube aspect. Yeah. I feel like the YouTube aspect is how most of my friends would follow it. So I feel like that would be 
an easy way of getting more views on it is if I could be seen drinking wine during it. But I also find that kind of black pilling and depressing. But For me, it's yeah. And I, I've thought about that too, like doing the video, but like, I'm like, oh, like editing video is such a bitch. Like, and I'm, uh, I have no idea about how yeah. any of this works. So I think that I just like, I just get to come and like, again, well, it's, this is so funny. So this actually, I think I told you this in Twitter messages, but this kind of works with going back to the sex sin, which is, I think that, um, I read somewhere when I was young that her favorite cocktail was like the cure Royale. And I think that I, um, when I first started drinking, when I was like 16, or like, I think that when I was with my parents and they would let me have a drink. So it's not like I'm going to the pub. It would be the one thing that I would always order because I had sex and drink it, which I think shows the amount of, again, not only interest in her art that I had, but I think interest in her as a person, which is kind of what we've kind of discussed is kind of how intrinsic is that to her art as well. But um, so I rocked up today. I um, had some Prosecco, but I didn't have any cures. So I've got this horrible apple black currant syrup uh. that I've added to my drink to kind of get into the sort of sexy state of mind. But um, so Sexton drink would be like a very glamorous drink. Like, uh... yeah, well, apparently I think that she was a big martini fan. I think that her um, I think that towards the end of her life, she became much more reliant on whiskey specifically, which I think is, again, kind of intriguing because it's a quite masculine drink, I think, to become kind of hooked on as well. And I think that I wonder if some of it, I think, it had to do with her sort of fading looks. And I think seeing herself as a sort of, I think in that way, feeling like she couldn't rely on her on her kind of feminine wiles as much and then becoming a sort of, well, now I'm going to be the old male writer who drinks whiskey and kind of like, sleeps with my students which is a kind of interesting archetype to already be <laughs> absolutely all right so yeah let's move to the very first book <laughs> so yeah wait so how first... do you usually do this so are we talking about books oh uh yeah for... This or... uh yeah for this i guess we just go one book at a time usually because like whenever i do like a book with a guest i usually just like to kind of go through it you know whatever you had notes on whatever you marked whatever you want to bring up or read or like it's all fair game feel free to be like let's cover this one i want to cover this one because i have like a list of things like okay these are the poems i want to cover from each book kind of and my kind of notes around them talking the questions blah 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 but yeah anything's fair game so anything you felt like you wanted to talk about or bring up and we just go book by book so first one we'll do is just like yeah the to bed lemon part way back and we'll just go yes, through that till we get to the end and then just kind of if yeah, no, depending on where we are like <laughs> i'm looking at so i have i've like kind of taken so i have to bed lemon part way back and all my pretty ones and i'm looking at them to bed lemon part way back is longer all my pretty ones is a bit shorter i think that is interesting because i think that i love how sexton develops as a poet but I do think that some of my favorite poems of hers are still kind of in this, in the first two collections. Yeah. And I think that there's a sort of clunkiness to her poetry, but I think there is a lot of hit and miss. Yeah, for sure. And there's like, especially for this one, listeners, like this To Bed Limb and Partway Back was her very first collection published in 1960. And it was mm -hmm. kind of like Sexton's, this is Sexton being introduced to the world here. And I think it's the same way. Like, I like seeing this. We already talked about this at the very beginning, like seeing the complete work. So we see this person just kind of dipping their toes in the water with this first book in 1960. And kind of, yeah, there's a lot of hit and miss. There's a lot of, uh, uh, there's, but then there's like, there's those moments where it does hit. Like it fucking hits, man. Like it hits. Like I, and... That's the thing, which is, I think that, so the first poem, I think is actually one of my favorite Saxon poems in general you, Dr. Martin. And the first thing I noticed is that it's center justified, which I think is such an amusingly adolescent decision to make. I think that when I wrote poetry as a kid, like when, but like as an eight year old kid, I center justified it. And I remember like, I actually loved this poem and I was showing it to a friend of mine who didn't know Sexton. That was the first thing that he noticed and he kind of saw it as a strike against her. But I think that this is I really like there's something in it which I really really find amazing and then I think that if you look at what kind of immediately follows it I think I'm less into kind sir these woods or a torn down from glory daily but then you get music swims back to me which is a fucking banger 
I mean, I don't know. What, what, where are your kind of thoughts as to how she's kind of introducing herself as a poet here? Yeah, for me, uh, you, Dr. Martin, I like as well. And I think like the centering of it, one, her lines are great. And then like two, it's almost like a throwback to the very old school kind of almost medieval poetry, even some of the romantics, like where you have this centered on the page and it kind of everything's very even, like in terms uh, of the lines and like the stanzas and like, you know, it makes sense for somebody in their first book to do something like that. But yeah, I like that. I love actually this is interesting. We should talk about I loved kind sir, these words, these woods. Ooh, really? Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's the poem. Well, I guess first on Yeah, let's Dr. Hit it. Yeah, I yeah. think that what I say with that is that what I really like is that I think that there's a sort of element with Anne Sexton of I think that you asking her something and then being like, or like she makes it seem like you've asked the question when you haven't. So I think that it's obviously starting with a kind of like you, Dr. Martin, but then there's this one line where then it's like, of course I love you. You lean above the plastic sky, God of our block, Prince of all foxes. And I think that there's a sort of, of course I love you, where it's like, it almost feels as if he's been wanting to solicit this from her though he hasn't, he's done nothing. And I think that it's this idea of like, how is it that she's sort of, like you make it feel as if it's somehow your fault that this thing is being confided in you. I mean, I really just love like. I mean, that break in the stanzas too, like that kind of, I mend what another will break, stanza break yeah. tomorrow period. And I know listeners will hear me complain about that in a lot of poems, but like, this is how you do that when you're doing it. Like yeah. this is perfect hesitation right there. And then it goes right into the next, to the next stanza like that. So listeners out I there, think- when you hear me contradict myself or whatever from like other things, so I just did like a thing on Sharon Olds and, and she does this terribly and yeah. I was criticizing it, but this is how you do it well. <laughs> yeah, like it's... Well, it's so funny though, because I think that this poem also shows some of what I love about Sexton and also what can frustrate me about Sexton in simultaneously next to it. So I think that one of the best lines is, and we are magic talking to itself, noisy and alone. Love that. And then I'm queen of all my sins forgotten. I think it's something that I almost feel like undermines how brilliant that line is. And I think that you can kind of see her broaching towards sort of brilliance because I think that I'm queen of all my sins forgotten is a bit overwrought, a bit cliche, but I think that thinking about kind of people in the asylum as being weird magic talking to itself, noisy and alone, I think is actually a really wonderful sort of image. Like you're really thinking of like almost kind of, I don't know, multiple TVs having static that pe- people are finding their own independent meanings and in. you're kind of together and talking, but there's still this massive aloneness in how you're interpreting reality amongst you. And I think that even like the idea of, you know, magic, we all think magic, uh, magic is fake. Is, is it a magic trick, a magic slide of the hand? Is it magic is in kind of occult stuff? I think that's a really brilliant line. And I think that you kind of see here that there's this sort of I think groping towards, I almost wonder whether she's almost apologizing for herself. I'm queen of all my sins forgotten with that, which I think she doesn't need. Yeah. Well, even so, like, I love the idea of romanticizing something like magic, like the kind of, like, I think it's so, it's very clinical kind of to say, oh, it's not real. But then like we refer to it as a descriptor all the time, like just kind of like, oh, it's magical or it's, it's this this thing beyond standard kind of, I don't know, like, like under, like beyond understanding or kind of like an easily explainable thing or feeling. Right. Like, I yeah, think that that's clear. like, it, it's like it, it, people refer, you know, that did the, do you believe in magic type thing? Right. It's almost like, yeah. a, do you trust your feelings here or do you trust this? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying with that, but no, I think- Right. I mean, I really love also the line, like the stanza before, which is what large children we are here all over. I grow most tall in the best word. Your business is people. You call it the madhouse, an oracular eye on our nest out in the hall. The intercom pages you. I think that there's something where there's a sort of what large children we are here. I think that it's a mix of. I think that also in it, what is it? The. Waking, uh, Waking in the Blue by Robert Lowell, which is about being in an asylum. This, and I think that this, I think that show this sort of weird situation that you're in, where I think that you have a essentially like children, like dad dynamic with your psychiatrist, where I think that like, I think that it's kind of funny. I think that whenever I read this poem, I kind of 
vibe on different things out in the hall the intercom pages you um it reminds me of i think when i was i forget that when i was in hospital you have to actually you're kind of stuck in like different sections and you have to right. intercom anywhere and i think that it's just so weird to kind of think about yeah i think it's almost i was joking with one of my friends about how there's a sort of video game element to it where i was talking to my friend and i'm like look I'm on this high level of it where they kind of leave me alone. You're on the low level. Let's just like get to the high level. Like you, you, we, what you want is to not have nurses bothering you. We want to like smoke cigarettes and bitch without nurses. Just like think about it that way. And I think that um, it's just like all over. I grow most tall in the best ward. And I think that thinking about tallness emotionally, like it doesn't really make sense. It's almost a childlike comparison. It sounds like something a child would say, which is like, how much have I grown today? Like, can we check my height? Right. And I think like that's sort of almost regression, which I really like. And it kind of like the kind of infantizing, infantizing the kind of emotional aspect because you're there for, uh, I guess that's what they always fucking talk about in therapy and kind of psychiatry, that the growth or the personal growth or something like that. Where it's like, yeah, all over, I grow most tall, and it's all over, too, right? In the best ward. <laughs> totally, which I love, because it's like, also, it's almost like the world's smallest midges, con midges contest, where I think it's like this sort of weird bragging of like, I'm in the best ward, I'm growing most tall. There is a sort of um, vulnerability of like pleading of like, tell me I'm a good girl almost with it. And yeah. I think that that's sort of, I think, a very kind of emotional space to be. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that, to be honest, for starting this collection, I think that this poem is a fucking banger. Yeah, and you always want to start your shit with a banger, too. Like, just kind of something that just sums it up, too. Like, and like you said, it's I, honestly, I mean, this isn't so Emily Dickinson, but this the title. So, like, you, Dr. Martin, the title after the first line, really kind of Emily Dickinson. I didn't get too much Dickinson vibes until, like, kind of that third book where I got like a big kind of dose in certain things. There's that, I, I wrote it down, but. You read, I'm sure you've read Neopelia in Sexual Persona with her essay on Emily Dickinson. She has this one line where she says, Emily Dickinson kind of eschewed writing about the, um, the mind as opposed to the brain and how she almost has this sort of almost physical, like, like she talks a lot about like I felt a funeral in my brain and there's right. this sort of idea brain instead of the mind and i think that in some ways maybe that's preempting the sort of physicality that sexton has as well which is a scientific one um not yet necessarily an erotic one yeah yeah i like that too but yeah it was it was cripples and other stories was the poem in uh live, live or die that that's i was like you have to listen to the um band do that because they make it a country song oh really they make it a like Proper country song is actually hilarious and so good. I think it's so amusing. I actually like that one. That's in Live or Die, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, when I was reading it, like something just, it, it, it was like lightning to me when I was reading it all of a sudden. I was like, this feels like Dickinson a little bit. I mean, it's obviously it's Sexton yeah, style. But the rhyme and the meter kind of was very Dickinson. I thought when I was reading through it, I was like, huh that's a little different than the previous ones, you know, like, think, and wasn't that poem mentioned in the beginning? It's either, I think that it's either mentioned in the foreword or it was mentioned, I think in a different essay that Maxine Human has about her, where I think that it says um, that this was a poem that she'd kind of thrown into the bin. And then this is one where she was like, let's pound it into form. Yeah. And I, think that's one where I think that you can kind of see that there's a sort of, I think that is quite amazingly, crude and weird and how i almost feel like it's i don't know like a bit of iron that's been kind of like jabbed out with a hammer to be forced into a certain shape and i think that seeing the kind of marks where the hammer was i think are part of its beauty yeah. so i think that it's, um yeah one of the, like i find that one really interesting and the way that i love about saxton is that she's willing to do this kind of unmetered unstructured stuff but then she also understood and i think all the poets back then did it's less so understood now that those types of like forms are there to help you, right? Like they're there to contain this big thought, yeah. like in this kind of, you know, a structured way. 
and I think even the limitations of the art, and I love talking about this on this podcast all the time, where they're like, there are limits, you know, like, I know we like to think of it as limitless, whatever, but we're talking about words on a page, you know, the language can only go so far, the descriptions can only go so far, we are limited by like the words we have, and I guess you'd be like Shakespeare or something or Berryman and invent new words, yeah. but like it's, it's, that is part of the art is working within the confines of not just the language, even if you're doing free verse or whatever, but then the confines of like an actual structure or a received form, like it helps creativity. Like it really does. Like you, you throw well, something absolutely. in the trash and then you take it out. Like, like obviously it's like the sort of Houdini act where I think that you often say what you think that like what you didn't think that you were going to say. I think that as a writer, the best poems happen when you surprise yourself and you weren't sure that like you didn't know that you were going towards that vault or that conclusion. And I think that that actually is such a kind of, that's why form can be a kind of huge help with that sort of thing. And I think that Sexton does work in it in spades here. Like I think especially, yeah, like in this sort of first collection, it's so funny. I'm looking at my notes. I don't know why. I just think I have next to the second and first poem. I just wrote two and three. Am I just numbering them? Was I just thinking like, that's the second poem. This is the third one. It's four, six, yeah, I have four, five. I stop at six, so I don't know what I was thinking there. But um, I know that with Elizabeth gone, is that Elizabeth was a kind of persona that she would have in therapy. So I think that she um, would often kind of imbibe this personality of Elizabeth who would kind of speak for her. And again, this sort of DID way, perhaps. But I think that those are the kind of notes that I have on that, which is interesting. But I really like the, you lay in the nest of your real death. And I think that if you see it as kind of talking to yourself, I think that thinking of this sort of, if, if she's tried to kill herself so many times, thinking of this fake death versus the real death and thinking of these versions that have kind of had the real death, I think is something that I think is really kind of compelling and strange to think about. I mean, I think that um, she obviously gets more into this in um, Live or Die in um, what is the poem Wanting to Die, which is like suicides have already betrayed the body. But I think that there's this kind of, yeah, already sort of interesting ambivalence of what does it mean to have stayed alive just like despite that, which I think that some of the poems deal with very well. And I think when you talk about like persona or creating a character that is yourself, like... I know there's all those arguments and you and I talked about Berryman a lot last time with kind of the Henry with the, like, I always compare like a more contemporary compare Slim Shady and Eminem, right? Like this kind of like, yeah. you create this kind of psychopathic alter ego or something that allows you to do be creative you're yourself still, but it allows you to be creative through a different, maybe it opens you up or allows you to be less afraid because there's like a little bit of a buffer between yourself and yeah. the output. And I think that's, you know, you don't see people do that that often anymore. Like, especially artists and writers kind of create these different. Uh... Yeah, that's interesting. I think you're right. I got in trouble at an after party recently for putting on Kim by Eminem because I actually <sighs> fuck. I love that song. I think that actually, though, in terms of like, I have this whole argument about how it's actually a quite feminine song because I think that like, or a feminist song, I think for him to like take on the voice of the abused woman whilst like the the only male lines are really like besides the ones where he's rapping back him being like so long bitch you did me so wrong i don't want to go on in the world without you that's so dumb it's so like lame rhyme yeah. but to have this kind of cheesy horrible rhymed chorus amongst this sort of domestic violence thing in which you're kind of acting with yourself i think that's like actually incredibly and exercising kind of empathy and a really really interesting kind of yeah i think to take on Anyway, I was told I was killing the vibes, which is probably true. Because it was it's such a violent song, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but, I know. Yeah. I think like suddenly, like Sarah, just put on Doja Cat or something. But that those first <laughs> couple albums are incredibly violent. Oh like those are those are. I've, I've, been, I've been so into Doja Cat recently. So. Really. Yeah, have you have you listened to Doja Cat before? Uh, just I remember when I was in grad school that I'm a cow bitch or whatever. Yeah, no. I think that she's anti-woke I think that she's quite funny I think it's actually interesting because I was saying to a friend recently about what I like about her which kind of ties into what we're saying about the confessionals is that um, I think that 
at the moment, I feel like a lot of pop singers, I think, seem very personality less. Yeah. I, think that I feel like, for example, like I think that when, what was it like Courtney Love said Taylor Swift was a safe space for girls. I don't have any real connection with Courtney, with um, Taylor Swift. I don't think that I have any real understanding of, I don't know what a Dua Lipa is. I don't know what that does. Right. And I think that Doja Cat, I think because she has a kind of messy persona, I think that I feel like that makes me like her music more. <clears throat> but it's kind of interesting because that's often what we're kind of criticizing in a lot of the poetry that we've been liking. Yeah, and it's also like when you talk about like the artists that were so... <laughs> influential and beloved like everybody brings up like madonna and these kinds of the person the persona and the personality and the kind of was the artist you know like like it, it was this kind of it it, it it enhanced the art like it enhanced the art to have this kind of public persona even if it's not the real person or it's some type of layer like uh like a alter ego or something that they can go into like it enhances the mystery or the curiosity and kind of the layers of all the art that's being put out too and i mean i think it's the same thing right like i think a lot of these artists would have probably be more open to that if they weren't so afraid of losing the deal losing the label you know like because they stepped on somebody's toes and whatever the new the most fashionable thing is it's uh it hurts art in so many different ways. Yeah. And I think it just must be unhealthy, I think, to tie so much of your artistic persona to a sort of identity. Yeah. Or like, just like two, like things that are essentially things that you've not been able to decide about yourself. Like, I think things like you can't really decide your race, class, or sex. And I think that these are things that are kind of given to you rather than decided upon. Right. And I feel like it must be a sort of lack of agency and feeling as if this is sort of, Thing that I'm most interested in or like this is what people are like seeking from me yeah and you kind of get buried under it yeah exactly well it's kind of what we were saying earlier about like um having to when sex sorry my friend texted me so I think that I'm quickly yeah, no worries my friend said how was the podcast and I said <laughs> I'm the third hour still doing it <laughs> <laughs> um but sorry, so I'll put that away. But um, yeah, I think that, yeah, it is interesting because I think that there is a sort of, I think that you're right. I especially think it's interesting that like Taylor Swift has a sort of um, era tour. And I think that the idea of eras is very much taken from like Madonna, who yeah. I think had eras though, but in a very natural, like she's fucking Madonna way. I don't know, like in a very, it felt very, it wasn't as if, like, I think that the way in which it's being done now is so kind of schlocky. Like, I think it's almost in the way that, for example, Anne Sexton has... Um, I love that I'm taking, like, Doja Cat and Madonna and everything back to Anne Sexton. Oh, but I yeah. think that there's, like, her kind of, like, horny era in love poems. There's this sort of, like, live or die era. And then there's, you could be, like, the sort of, um, like, the fairy tale era. And then the sort of, like, religious era. But I think that this idea of kind of conceiving of... Um, your work is as kind of fragmented and separated. Like I think it, it makes it out into not having a personality so much as a kind of persona. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's a good way, like, especially when you do like certain kind of like Madonna and stuff, I think it's almost like you can reject certain parts of yourself as you kind of grow as an artist too. You can kind of be like, Oh, I'm not into that anymore. So I'm just going to fucking do something like just go off on this. Yeah. Like, yeah. And like Sexton, I think all the greats really do this. And then you kind of, but then it's easy to get bogged down on it too if you get too obsessed with that kind of persona or that different, I don't know. I mean, because I mean, you're always reaching for things. That's what I like about art. I think that's what everybody kind of listening to this and you and I, like what I'm so drawn to is like it is this kind of, uh, like like you're, you're, you get bored. You get bored with yeah, doing the same yeah. thing. Yeah. And then you're searching for well, something new. That again, when we talk about form, I think that people like to set traps for themselves. I think that the ideal is a trap that takes you a while to get out of. And I think that that's kind of where often the most interesting poetry comes from. It's a sort of trap that takes you a while to figure out its mechanism. And I think that figuring out its mechanism is often in which you come to the most interesting and poetic conclusions, the most striking of images, and kind of most cool things linguistically. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, did you want to hit Kind Sir These Woods? or? Uh... Yeah, let's do it. Really, the I like things. 
I like this idea of like, let's hit it. Yeah, so, yeah absolutely. Right, so, so I'm intrigued. So I think that I was vaguely kind of relooking, casting my eye at it while we were talking. And I do forget, it does actually kind of slap. So what did you, so what, what, what are your kind of thoughts on it? What were you saying? Okay, so for me, really, the things that really stood out to me were, were the kind of, um, one, like it kind of goes with the themes, but two, I think that the last kind of three lines uh, really made me, was the reason that I really was like, oh, I want to hit this. And then like, there's that one section kind of like in the middle where she rhymes Belle with Mademoiselle. Yeah. And I was just kind of like, ooh, because I wasn't expecting it. Yeah, because I think that this is one where I think that there's sort of weird rhymes in it. Because I think it starts with like, there's also even before that, like the forest between Dingy, Dell. There's these already kind of preemptive echoes of that. And I think that this is a good idea, idea example of the sort of like good rhyme that comes in and kind of it doesn't take you outside of the poem, but makes you kind of conscious of how the poem is working. Because I think that I love like, that the coast cry of doom was uh, was that far away bell, Bowie's bell, said your nursemaid is gone, oh, mademoiselle, the robot rocked over, then you were dead, turned around one size tight, the thought in your head. Because I think that dead and head, again, are kind of much more clunky rhyme there. And I think that it's almost what I was saying, like, I feel like that's the moment that was similar to what I was saying with um, I'm queen of all my sins forgotten earlier, where I think that bell and mademoiselle, though, is just like so. Also, imagine her reading, well, I think, I guess I live in England. So for me, imagining her reading this in American accent is like makes it chef's kiss. But I guess that's just, I guess that that's probably not new to you. Yeah. I'm and, and I like, I've been really obsessed with this idea recently of romanticizing the woods and kind mm. of um, uh, like maybe like it's a because, walk yeah. And, and not just that. I think uh, in, maybe it's cause I live in a desert now, like in Vegas where there's like no trees or woods anywhere. But like where I grew up on the kind of East Coast of America, it was like I always woods was freedom. Like you went into the woods to hide, to play, like to kind of get away from adult supervision. Like and you could like kind of anything went in the woods, right? Like you could go hide out right. in that. And I like this idea of and she even talks about it, like this is an old game, like kind sir, like almost mm -hmm. like children playing in the woods. And maybe that's what kind of like hit me. And then the kind of like losing yourself too. Like the whole thing starts with the kind of Walden quote, right? Oh, yeah, you're right. I just, I've really kind of been, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me personally. That I just like... love the woods were white as well. Because I think that that's something that you don't often associate with woods. It's almost kind of then taking it into surreal images. The woods were white and my, my, and my night mind saw strange happenings untold and unreal. Exactly. And I think you write the last three lines, I think, are wonderful. Yeah, and it's like, and that's too, like, so it's this magical place. And then you think, obviously, her love of fairy tales were like the, the kids that would go into the woods were the ones that would get, like, in trouble or whatever and like, the fairy tales yeah, or and like, stuff. And, like, murdered and turned into pies. Yeah. Even. And, like, it's great during the daytime and, like, the way that the woods does change. So when it's light out, the woods feels kind of magical and romantic. And then when the sun goes down and it's dark it's like scary and like you hear things and you can't see them. And it's like this kind of being lost and that you get lost much easier if it's not during the day. Right. Like, and if you don't know the territory, like the woods in the area and it's not like, you know, where I grew up, the woods was not like this big vast thing. It was like a small area that like hadn't been cut down for houses yet, you know, like in like yeah, a neighborhood, yeah. suburban neighborhood. So it's like, yeah, I love that too. And the woods were white in my night mind. Saw such strange happenings, untold and unreal. Yeah, yeah. I think I like it. I feel like untold and unreal. I think if I was editing someone else's poem, I'd be like, choose one. But I think that <laughs> it really works because she's very excessive as a poet. It kind of works here. And opening my eyes, I'm afraid, of course, to look. This inward look that society scorns. Yeah. And I guess in that case, turning the woods into oneself, like the woods of oneself and find, yes, till I search in these woods. Also, it's the beginning of Dante's Inferno starts with being in the woods, doesn't it? So I think that there's this kind of entire precedent of like being the, the woods is a kind of site of self-exploration. Yeah. And how it's like so, untamed parts of nature, right? Like it's so untamed in that sense, like. 
And like, yeah, still I search in these woods and find nothing worse than myself caught between the grapes and the thorns. Kind of... I think that it's gorgeous. One sec. I need to pop to the loo incredibly yeah, no quickly. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm back. Yeah, I think Heinz through these woods. It's also interesting to see how she uses. I think that in the first few collections, she really goes for epigraphs a lot more. Yeah. I think that there's a like there's a few poems. I'm trying to find one now, but I think that there's a few that she has that she does kind of like punctuate with sort of context. I think that I wonder if also having starting it with this sort of letter of, um, of Schopenhauer to Goethe, and having that, I almost wonder. To me, strikes me as maybe perhaps showing some of her intellectual insecurity amongst the other poets, because I yeah. think that again, this is her first collection, and I do wonder if having that these two in quite quick succession almost show that she was kind of wanting to show that she has read these things or that like she's re or at least she's reading these things. Yeah. Cause I think that there's very much kind of belittling, I think, especially, you know, Helen Vendler, I think was kind of quite anti-sexton and I like a lot, like we'll get into Helen Vendler wrote the meanest review of transformations, which is the very <laughs> one. And I'll wait for that for our episode there. But I think that, I think that she did have a sort of anxiety about her own place in terms of sort of literary history there. So I think that that's kind of interesting to think that, yeah, it's kind of starting with these two bang on canonical epigraphs. Yeah. And it's like, so like, uh, like that's very real, like kind of like feeling the kind of the, the intel, like the intellectual fear or inferiority uh, when you are like kind of trying to branch into a field that is kind of hoity-toity like poetry, you know, like at least has that reputation to be it's not so hoity-toity anymore. I mean, you know, you look at some of this contemporary stuff, but it's like there is like, you know, when you when somebody finds out that you write poetry or you like poetry, or you can actually understand it and talk about it at length. Like they're almost like there's an intimidation factor. They feel inferior yeah. in some way if they can't like... Well, I think it's interesting because I think that kind of so these words kind of has almost a kind of tentative or even clumsy kind of relationship with its own rhymes. Because I think that obviously at the end it ends with like scorns and thorns, but that's not quite straightforward. I think that she seems like a poet who is interested in rhyme, but still hasn't quite internalized meter yet. And meter is still like, because I think that that's often what makes the rhyme land. But I think right. that that's quite hard to teach unless you're really kind of imbibing it. I was very happy that I saw my student recently and she was like, Sarah, I'm not gonna lie. I've just been thinking and I am a pentameter this week. And I was like, good. That's exactly what you need to do. I'm happy yeah. she's like, I'm coming out like that. And I'm like, this is how you will become a great poet. But I think that you can see here this kind of focus on the rhyme, while I think not quite, which I find actually is funny because I think that with another poet, I wouldn't find it charming, but I think I find it weirdly charming here. Yeah, I remember when I was reading a lot of Rothke, I was reading like his complete uh, works. And he has, you know, most of his books were like that stupid kind of nursery rhyme meter. Um, but, and But like for a while there, everything I would write while reading that, like, you know, his complete works <clears throat> was kind of coming out in that kind of nursery rhyme meter. And I got this idea that I really wanted to do some weird shit with that, like have a nursery rhyme meter but then have the content be like incredibly like out there and kind of like, ins like weird and insane or I something. Well, this is why, um, again, you should look into Frederick C. Dell because I think that he has this sort of weird way of rhyming that I, that I was saying to my friend when I met him recently, it got stuck in my head where I suddenly started looking at everything and I was thinking about it in that way. I think I was waiting for him to, um, we we're gonna see a gig together. And I think that I just started writing in the back of my thing where he showed up and he's like, what have you been doing? And I'm like, well, we both like this poet. I think his way of speaking is like trapped in me. And so I can only look at items and think about them in this like sort of weird rhyme way. Do you want me to say some? And he's like, no, sir, let's, do you want to have a cigarette and be a normal person? I'm like, uh -huh. yeah, okay, fine. Let's, yeah, sure, let's do that. <laughs> but I think that, um, yeah, that's so interesting. I think that the sort of, um, I think that you can kind of catch other poets in the same way that you catch a cold. Whereas like you sort of have this sort of vague, like, I don't know, 
yeah, like it's almost like a sneeze where you have kind of have the impulse of a sneeze to be kind of taking on some of their sort of um, animus. And I think that that's sort of um, especially easy to do with poets who I think are incredibly formally consistent. Yeah. Or are these distinctive with their form? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Or like Dickinson, the same thing where I was kind of, you get stuck in her like kind of. Yeah, so much with Dickinson. I think that Dickinson's someone who I almost feel like I have to treat like absinthe and just take out every once in a while because I think that otherwise it's so easy to sort of like fall into that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, nice. Yeah, what else did you want to hit in this? So I think, let me see. So I think that I like music swims back to me. I'm trying to see nice. if there's any like for me, like said the poet to the analyst. I like that one as well, yeah. Your kind is obviously a banger. I think that, oh, Unknown Girl, the maternity ward. I think I've read a lot of Moss of His Skin. I've been really into. I'm trying to see. It's so funny what I do and don't have notes on. Elegy in the Classroom, I know, is about Robert Lowell. <sighs> the Double Image, I think, is a very ambitious poem that I think falls at a few points. And then I think, I guess, we go to All My Pretty Ones. So I think that with the beginning, I don't know, of these. So what do, what do you want to hit? Uh, yeah, I definitely had... Also, uh... I think just gonna put this out here now because i didn't realize if we started podcasting at 6 30 we should probably end it around 10 just because i will like i feel like it's so it's it's a lot of podcasting in a yeah, fun yeah, way yeah, 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 yeah. so yeah. i think that like but i think that i also i'm just letting you know that this might mean that we might just cover the first book is that's that fine. like yeah that's fine yeah. i i really don't mind meeting up for ages and like chatting online this is so much fun like, I think that I will so, and also All My Pretty Ones is some of my favorites, but I think that, I don't know if we can even get to that. Yeah, I mean, that's fine with me. Yeah, like, that's, yeah. I mean, like, I mean, I mean, shit, if we could, if it's going to take us, like, an episode per book, that's, like, eight episodes or whatever of this. I think like, no, I think that we should do that. Yeah, that's fine with me. I think that we should learn how to edit video and then we'll get more views. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, there's, but I just, like, because I like to just be like, all right, yeah, I mean, we go till we don't till we've said what we need to say or whatever or yeah like starting a whole book at the end of this like if we're not like i feel like we're barely gonna get through this first one but yeah i know me too <laughs> but yeah i have no, the poet to an analyst i feel like oh yeah so my poet so let me have a look yeah so i really like this one because i think that what i really like about it is i think that it almost shows her sort of weirdness of i think that the simile of like words or like labels or coins or better like swarming bees i think that she's almost revising her own similes as she's writing and i like this sort of almost kind of flirtatious speculativeness of kind of being like i feel like i can see her being like they're like labels or coins or way better bees and i think that there's this sort of having these multiple images in quick succession which i think makes it kind of interesting because i think that then as a reader you're sort of carried along with her in that way um in her own kind of like it's a very train of thoughty in that way and i think i really approach that and then i love that i confess i am only broken by the source of things as if words were counted like dead bees in the attic so suddenly this is extending the metaphor the bees are not only like so there are swarming bees and now these are dead bees that are being counted in the attic and i think that there's a sort of interest in how she's sort of yeah, going from one image, like trying to sort of, trying to almost like hover above the image that she wants to settle on and then goes to that. Unbuckled from their yellow eyes and their dry wings. I think being unbuckled from your eye is such a kind of creepy, wonderful image. Absolutely. And the bees keep coming up too, like the bees, insects, bells, bones, uh, yeah. witches, birth. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think that I remember, like, this is actually a quite kind of meta poem, which is, I must always forget how one word is able to pick out another, to manner another until I've got something I might have said but did not. And so I feel like there's a sort of interest in, there's actually a kind of moral or at least psychiatric imperative in choosing the right word. And I think that, again, if we always think of poetry as like, is it words with, he's like the best words in the right order. I think that this is putting a lot of pressure onto like, well, I'm a poet, my business is words. But actually like, 
one word can cancel out the other. And actually, you have to make sure that you're saying something that's utterly correct, which is actually a lot of pressure to put on yourself as a poet, which I really, really like here. And I think is really interesting. Absolutely. Plus, like, I love the Nevada references and shit just because I live in Nevada. But like, and like, wait, but... let me do that more. So because I think that well, I, I mean, so, yeah, I love that, which is it's a nickel machine, like a gambling thing. Yeah that one night in Nevada telling how the magic jackpot came clacking three bells out over the lucky screen. Yeah. And just the, the Nevada is one of those, I, maybe it's just I, my tendency to romanticize. Like it is one of those States where it's a young state. It like in the U S as far as States go. And like, like I don't think it was officially a state until like 1906 or something like that. And so, like, California was a state before Nevada was and all of that. And uh, it just, it was always this place of, like, you go to, to, you go to the springs in the northern part of the state if you're, like, you don't know, sick or whatever. And you have to go to, like, the, like, Mark yeah. Twain era, like, go up there. And then it was, like, the divorce ranches before Vegas was a thing. It was, like, oh, the place so where... Uh, because you only had to have residency for six weeks until you could qualify as a resident there and then get divorced. So a lot of wealthy people, like I think famously Clark Gable and Greta Garbo, uh, uh, she moved to Nevada for like six weeks so she could divorce him. And uh, Edith Wharton books, I love Edith Wharton and that's like a big thing. Yeah, and a lot of the wealthy upper class, if you could afford to move somewhere for six weeks, like take the train out to Nevada and then you would uh, just live there in like some resort for six weeks. They called them like divorce ranches. Yeah. Where, that's yeah. And it's just like I'm... this romanticized thing and just the lights now that Vegas is a thing. And I guess at this time when she was writing this in like the late fifties into 1960, it would be like Vegas was already a thing. So the bright lights and the gambling were like a thing by then. But uh, yeah, I just love it's... that. Because I you know the way in which he's kind of using the Vegas metaphor of talking about gambling is, I guess, how you use words, which is, I think that often, I think that, I mean, something like, I don't know, it's so funny. I went through a brief, like, I'm really not a gambler because I think that I get too emotionally upset when I lose money. I think yeah. that, like, I live next to this casino in Bristol. And I think that they would often, like, I think that I went there because they had very cheap drinks. And me and my ex, and also you could smoke inside, which yeah. is very rare. So it's that me and my ex, here, rare, yeah. we could smoke inside and we could like get very cheap drinks, but we, they'd often have deals to get you to go in. So I'd start with like 20 pounds and I'd be like, awesome. And either the moment I lost it, I think I'd be too crushed to continue. Like I'd be like, I don't get any high from the sort of happiness of winning money. I think I only feel the sadness, but I'm very intrigued by, yeah, this idea of, there's almost this like sort of like when she's like words are like labels, coins or swarming bees. I must see it as putting coins in the slot machine as which is going to stick, which will be the kind of moneyed word. Because I think that if you're working with this analyst, it's sort of you're almost having this sort of gamble of how am I going to be able to express myself in a way that I what's going to what's going to strike the money. And then I think that at the end is kind of funny because it ends with. Um, but if you should say this is something it is not, then I grow weak remembering how my hands felt funny and ridiculous and crowded with all the believing money. Yeah. It's sort of, well, what is, what is the outcome of having this correct word? It's sort of like, okay, so you have this believing money, but like, yeah, but like, do you even believe in this money that you've won? I think that I guess is if we're thinking about this as a sort of metaphor for therapy or mental health, it's kind of interesting to think that it's sort of like, it's almost sort of, yeah, I think this is also one that's kind of meta about how we almost consume her own madness, which is like, which some metaphors are going to strike us and some might not. Absolutely. Absolutely. And like, yeah, like, I think it's so powerful that they'll believe in money on its own line as well. Like, the uh, kind of... I think it's so funny. Well, I love it because it's like, I think that when I first read this, I thought it was um, about you believing in money as in like how you co-opt in the, but like, I love the idea that actually rereading it it's kind of money personified as if the money is believing in itself or the money is believing in its own efficacy to kind of complete these things. So I think that that's kind of like, 
Yeah, it's such a strange little turn of phrase that I think for me, I'd say that this is very quintessentially an Anne Sexton trick Absolutely. that she does. Or something like that is I'm like, wow, that's actually really good and really weird. But I don't really like it's almost hard to kind of verbalize what it's done with its sort of weird twist the knife that works well. Yeah, absolutely. And the kind of like, but I admit nothing, like the kind of your business is yeah. watching my words, but I admit nothing. This, this, the money, but any kind of believing or yeah, personifying the money to believe these types of words or believe in the value or believe in the kind of how ridiculous and crowded <laughs> the hands felt. I love that though, because I yeah. think that it's like, and also, yeah, I think that there's something like, also, but if you should say something, it is not, which I think, again, also, again, this sort of you, which I've been obsessed with, is almost thinking about you as a reader, which is like, if we as a reader are interpreting this wrong, then she will grow weak. It almost kind of puts you in a weird position where it's not only you, the analyst, but I love that it's also started with said the poet to the analyst. And I think that that in its own way is the kind of quotations that Robert Lowell said he wanted to kind of put... Um, like said she should be putting around her poems. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, did you want to hit her kind? I guess we feel like, feel like we I have mean, to. I think that that's, we uh, we probably can't do it without doing that, can we? Yeah. <laughs> I did this poem for a long time. I think that I remember when I was, I think that I was like 17 or 16 and we uh, I was in a poetry class just in high school and we all had to remember a poem and present the poem to a class and I think that I'd already remembered this poem and my teacher was like Sarah you're not allowed to memorize a poem you've already remembered and so I had to do something else but I think all the students were like Sarah this is like so not fair you just like you get a cheap easy way of like you're a fucking poet I was trying to I was trying to help them game where I was like look if you want to memorize a poem kids look for the sonnets this is going to be like this this is a mechanism for memorizing things you'll be able to do it and they did not take my advice they all wanted to do like e coming so i'm like you're gonna fucking fail at that but with her kind i think that this is a um i think one i think that this poem is very formal i think that obviously i think that we we're talking about how i think that she's kind of seen as a sort of um strictly confessional thing i think that when i often read it what I find interesting is that I think that it obviously starts out with the kind of sexy 12 fingered witch, but I think that often when I reread it, it's a second stanza, which is I think the kind of housewife witch, which is a, I have found the warm caves in the woods, filled them with skillets, carvings, shelves, closets, silks, innumerable goods, fixed a supper for the worms and the elves, whining, rearranging the disaligned, a woman like that is misunderstood. I've been her kind. And that's the sort of, I think that then we get into the sexy nude arms witch, but I think that there's something really wonderful about this sort of domestic witch as well that's given space. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the fact that it's like, well, we already talked about like kind of reinventing yourself in the different kind of ways that like you kind of, as you live your life and there's all these different personas and not even that they're personas, but just like, you know, as you live a life, you do become a different person through these different periods, <laughs> you know, and like, I feel like it's her way of kind of trying to encapsulate all of it, like all of these different types, yeah. like, and then your I think moods it's also too, like, right. Like how the mood changes you and the kind of your, Oh, I feel like being this type of woman today, or, Oh, I feel like being this type or, or person. Yeah, you know, I don't have to... I guess, Cause looking at this, I think is that there's this intent one, I think that you're completely right. And that I think that it's just sort of working through feminine archetypes, but I think that within it, a woman like that is not a woman quite. I think that she's almost seeing, I think that it's almost intriguing how in her own kind of flagrant sexuality, her own kind of weird mysticism, she's almost kind of cast out from being seen as a woman. Yeah. Like I think that that almost kind of makes her somehow like disavows her own femininity from her, which I think is really, really interesting. And like the and image think, of the witch, right? Like doing that as well. I mean, I also have to say that with the witch hitch rhyme, I think that in some ways it's amazing that we have the echo unsaid of probably bitch in our minds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not said, but I think that it's kind of purposely echoing in our head where I think that there's this sort of witch bitch mentality through it. And I think that 
it's a poem that again we were talking in the beginning of the podcast about how her glamour persona kind of colors how we read her poems and i think that this is a very self-aware poem which is i think that especially with the last verse about like waving her nude arms at the villagers going by i think that that's very much a sort of I feel like that's a very good metaphor for essentially like, yeah, her and the reader, which I think works. And then a woman like that is not ashamed to die. I've been her kind. I think it's kind of, it's like, again, this is something that I feel like is one of her more simple poems, but it's one of those things where it's a kind of crazy thing to write out loud. Yeah. And I mean, simplicity, I think it's underrated sometimes. And I mean, they're throughout different periods and kind of literary history where, you know, the trend is to overcomplicate it to the point where it's kind of like a, you know, intellectual game. But then sometimes somebody comes along and does something so simple that you can't help but recognize the kind of greatness in that, like this kind of, it's not burying itself. It's not, and it, it's very kind of openly going right to the heart of it. And, and Sexton's so good at that. I mean, a lot of the confessional yeah. greats are good at that, but it's just, there's something about it. And I think maybe like this is probably why it's one of her most famous, right? Like, because it's easier to understand for people that even aren't into poetry or don't even, you know, obsessively studied this shit like we have. Like, you know, it's just easier for somebody to come to it, read it and be like, oh, I know what she's talking about. Like, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It's so interesting to think that you're talking about this simplicity. And I think I'm thinking of the adjectives in this poem I love, which is like the black air, the plain houses. These are ones that are kind of incredibly non-poetic. It's just very straightforward ways of describing something. And I think that that works really, really well towards the advantage of this poem, where I think that it is kind of, again, you're right, using, I think I'd say both simple and simplistic. Like, I think if we both see them as kind of d distinct things, I think right. as a kind of way of working towards this kind of positive end where I think that to end with a woman like that is not ashamed to die. I think it's a line that in most poems you could really not get away with. I think right. that that's a line that I think that like I'd be skeptical of seeing in almost any other context, but I think in this one, I think really works well. 100%. Absolutely. And like, yeah, even the, 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 and like you said, with the simple and the simplistic, like we're talking metaphor, talking actual language, and then talking like the actual kind of content itself, like, like, you have to earn that kind of simple line right there, the kind of penultimate, like line, you have to really earn that with the previous stanzas and the kind of repetition of I have been her kind kind of self implicating even so that it makes it so that it's less judgmental even though it is judgmental in some ways like totally and I think it's so interesting because I think that again I think as a poem it's sort of almost going to like first being like well a woman like that's not a woman quite and then a woman like that is misunderstood and then a woman like that's not ashamed to die. It's almost this kind of interesting dialectical thing between being like, well, I'm not a woman. Actually, I'm a woman who's misunderstood to actually I'm a woman who's acting almost as a martyr. And I think that that's a sort of intriguing sort of negotiation with your own femininity that happens throughout the poem, which I think like, again, using these three pretty simplistic stanzas to be able to kind of go for that is pretty I think it's, yeah, it's very impressive, I think, especially for a first collection. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, yeah, well, how much, I mean, yeah, we've, we're saying so much. I mean, and this poem has been written about to death, talked about to death, because it is one of her most famous, but it is, and that's also, why. So, you know, I think that it is, it's so interesting, is I think that what I found since I've been looking at Sexton in this kind of wider way, is I think that how much I do think that every book of hers, I do think has bangers that should be the most famous. I think that it's so interesting that I think that we saw in the beginning where Maxine Cuman says something very strange, I think in the very end where she says something where it's like, time will sort out the dross among these poems and burnish the gold. But I think that she's aware that there's almost a kind of quality issue across everything. Yeah. But it's kind of interesting because I think that with Anne Sexton is not, I think like she had kind of one book where everything is gold. I think that there's such kind of smatterings of genius amongst everything that I really enjoy. And I think makes her very well suited for the sort of kind of excavation of her. And it's just like, I always try to stress too, to people listening, all that, like just how difficult 
writing a whole book of gold is. You know, there's a few writers that have pulled it off, but only a few, you know, like that no, have pulled absolutely. off like, like oh, everything in this book is pure gold. Like it's fucking hard, man. Like and and especially for a first book to be able to do that, no way. Like no way. No, and I think that it's interesting. Like, I mean I guess another poem I'd like to talk about. Yeah, please. Is, um, do you know, like, so I was very intrigued by Unknown Girl and the Maternity Ward is a poem that I always read <laughs> some pages before. I think that that's one, I think that, I think I have lots of notes from this from when I was young. Cause I think that this is one that's very explicitly a kind of dramatic monologue one. But I think that this is also, I think one that shows part of why Sexton can be brilliant and also some of her failings, which is, I think that it's in the fourth line it says, your lips are animals, you are fed with love. At first, hunger is not wrong. And then in the third stanza, there's this line, the animal of your lips, your skin glowing warm and plump. And I think that this shows that I think that there is a sort of almost like bloated repetition of images, which I think that when you, when for me as a reader, when I first read the poem, I did not notice that there is a sort of repetition or like almost pillaging of images earlier in the poem. But I think when I was writing on it academically, I think that there's a kind of tick with Sexton where I do think that often you find that there's sort of um, things that, yeah, like she ends up repeating and pillaging her own kind of images and her own metaphors kind of become like, even within the same poem, I think to see it so kind of flagrantly is kind of funny, which is like, how did an editor not pick up on this? I think that if I was in an editorial situation that would have been flagged up so fast. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I guess this is kind of like, I mean, this one is one of those ones where it shows really, I think her skill too is how rich a lot of sex and stuff can be where like, I think uh, as a younger reader and stuff and you, you immediately go to the confessional aspect of it. Cause okay. Unknown girl in a maternity ward or all of her hospitalizations, you think medical, you think of all that, but it goes so much deeper than that. And the kind of, even like, I, I like, even like the expatriates, like, uh, like just the way she manages to capture those types of things. I think like the images, the animals, uh, yeah, your skin growing warm and plump. I see your eyes. It's just, I mean, only somebody with kind of the confidence of Sexton could, like you said, get away with a lot of this stuff. And it's interesting that so much art, particularly poetics, when you're kind of, I don't want to say breaking the rules, but, you know, kind of along those lines, like confidence goes a long way. Like just kind of being like, fuck you, I can do this, you know, like kind of really, I mean, just adds a layer of, I don't want to say attitude, but just interest and kind of the boldness of being willing to kind of, yeah, like you said, front load all these images and then constantly be bringing them back up. I, yeah, I guess you could say it's reference to some of the greats that have done it before, but I still like, that's a brilliant way to do it. Completely. And I think that also, this is one that I think is very sort of, again, one of the more formal ones. I think that I can see that I, wrote some kind of attempt of trying to figure out what the rhyme scheme was when I was, I guess, like 19, I guess, which is so funny. Like I'm looking at what I wrote at the end of this and I say, anaphora. So I guess I must have just learned the word anaphora. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, and I don't even think that I'm using it correctly. <laughs> um, I think that there's, um, yeah, I think this one I think is interesting because I think that often with her more sort of obviously dramatic monologue type poems. I think that she's sort of um, working in this sort of more formal form. I think that what I really like is, what well, I always go again, like love is the kind of end of it, which is, I touch your cheeks like flowers, you bruise against me, we unlearn. I am a shore rocking you off, you break from me. I choose your only way, my small inheritor, and turn you off, trembling the selves we lose. Go child who is my sin and nothing more. I think that is something that I've noticed that I guess is a huge influence in how I write is that we unlearn. I think that we unlearn is such an interesting way of putting this kind of very personal relationship between like a mother and her newborn child. And like the one thing that is happening, which is pre-lingual, is this sort of way in which you physically are going to breastfeed or hold them or even see them with each other. And to have, you have to go and we both unlearn that there's a sort of having to 
relearn something elsewhere, I think is really, really beautiful. Absolutely. And I'm thinking now, could we talk to personas, how it is kind of like taking on this persona of the unknown girl, like kind of, and especially with that last line hitting in that way that it does go child who is my sin and nothing more is just, man, that really hits now that we've been talking. This is why I like talking about this kind of stuff. Cause when you're just doing it yourself, you know, you have your thoughts, but then when you have somebody else's thoughts come in too, it's like, Oh yeah. yeah oh yeah. <laughs> like, Oh fuck. Yeah. We talked about this and you could see it like, Oh, fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. It's funny, so even this stanza starts with, and now that's that. There's nothing more I can say or lose. I think that there's a poem much later in Love Poems, which we'll get into, I guess, later on, which also has this sort of, and that will be that. But I think that that's actually a very kind of interesting colloquialism to be invoking there, which is that it's this sort of like mundane, and now that's that, amidst this sort of, before that is, I name you bastard in my arms, name a father nun, which is a very heartbreaking scene. Now that's that. And I think that maybe perhaps what is kind of interesting about Sexton is how she's able to kind of normalize or make every day this sort of things. Like I think, again, if we've been talking a lot about trauma, that there's a sort of constant overloom of having to make everything like this is trauma. And then I was to talk about this kind of mundanity of, well, that's that. This happened. And I think that to kind of invoke that sort of colloquialism, I think, is really powerful in this poem. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, it speaks to like what she was so good at too. like maybe people like Vendler and all like we'll get to later on in, in, in coming episodes, listeners like weren't seeing that. Like, I think there's a way where you get too academically minded and you start to get blinded to these much easier things to pick up on that are much more human too. you know, academia is kind of not so like natural, like a state of things. It's kind of like a uh, you have to kind of learn how to intellectualize things in that way. And it, it's, it's, it makes you miss some of these, these, these smaller, almost easier to understand things, you know? Totally. And I think that this is a poem where, again, like, I think this shows her kind of skill at being able to embody a voice that's very confessional. Whilst I think that this is a poem that is very implicitly, as Robert Lowell said earlier, in quotation marks. And I think that that makes it kind of, interesting and i think that that's something that like i've always been kind of attracted to about it and i really love that there's all these sort of domestic images like you tip like a cup and things like that i think that there's something that's very sort of i love like the doctor so it's like they guess about the man who left me some pendulum soul going the way men go i think when i was a child i loved a teenager i loved the idea of this pendulum soul as being the sort of womanizer. And I think that that, like, I think the pendulum as a kind of male image comes back in a few of her poems later in love poems. Absolutely, absolutely. And even like, like I, I like that the poem, The Expatriates, like the reason I, I thought like, the Ooh, way- yeah, I love, What page is that on? Uh, 21. 21, awesome. Where yeah. there's like this, for me, like it, it really appealed to me in the sense of like, there's a few line break qualms I'd have, but like the fairy tale stuff is used so well in this, but then also the kind of selfishness that's articulated in this. That's also very like, like this is how people feel, you know, like even that first stanza, my dear, it was a moment to clutch at for a moment so that you may believe in it. And believing is the act of love. I think even in the telling wherever it went, like just kind of this, and it almost gets back to that magic that you brought up when we first started going into this, like this kind of like the believing in things, the believing money, the believing like, yeah. like this is the well, act of life is believing and this in things. Just goes to what we were saying, like what do men love about crazy chicks? <laughs> Which is, it has to do with I think this sort of glamour, with this sort of rule breakingness, where it was like, okay, well this is a game that we're believing in and we're going to play that game or maybe we're not going to play that game and we don't believe in it. And I think that there's a sort of within her poetry itself, it's a sort of talking about like excavating things like, do we even believe in money or do we believe in this moment or what is it? I think that there's a sort of almost once the kind of general kind of safety pins on reality begin to loosen, there's a sort of what can happen, which can either be very terrifying or very erotic. And I think that that's, she kind of straddles those two emotions throughout this first collection. 
Absolutely. Damn, that sounded good. So <laughs> well, it's good because it's true. That's why I think that's what's great about podcasting too, is when you're long form and you have a chance to keep thinking and keep thinking, it comes uh, out you're like, Oh yeah, I said that. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. I know. I also okay, as a joke, I wanted to say when you I can't believe that the little bit of the clip that you did for the teaser was me flirting with you and saying that you look <laughs> like you're naked. Are you going to, are you going to do that again? Uh well, I just did that because that's literally just like the first, uh, what I think when, when I do the jerk shops, I usually try to do like the first 20, 30 minutes, depending on how long we chatted for. So I was just like the very first like uh, uh, intro thing. And it was one, I think it's great. And two, it was no, like, I think uh, it's hilarious. I think uh, you know, that I think that's very good. But I was so amused when it came out because I think that at that time I was like, I was suddenly like, oh my gosh, I'm going to see, like, <laughs> like, my, my, like I said it to a friend and he was like, share it everywhere, so you come off fine, it's fine. Right, <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh my gosh, do I seem like some kind of like transatlantic harlot? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> no, <laughs> and, yeah. Like me, innocent me coming on to a poetry podcast and saying somebody looks like a famous actor. So I don't know, I was suddenly <laughs> like, oh my gosh. But, <laughs> well, that was deep <laughs> into the podcast too. I don't worry, I paywalled all the, the most uh, the most embarrassing parts that are not like even embarrassing, I wouldn't say. They were no, just I like, don't. yeah, not like, uh, yeah, like you said, I think at one point you said, all right, paywall this part because you didn't want your parents to hear it or something. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Like, and, yeah. and the best thing that I think that, I don't think that my parents will actually end up right. listening yeah. to this four hour long conversation yeah. I've had this person. I think that like literally I came in earlier, I was hanging out with my mom earlier today and she, I was like, hey, should I podcast from my house or yours? Because we live, like, within 10 minute walk from each other. And she, like, she's like, Sarah, just go to your house. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, okay, good. I, she's like, Sarah, like, I've actually, like, you come into my house, like, every day because they have a cute dog. And they're like, you yap all the time. It's like, I'm not going to listen to your podcast yapping about me. <laughs> Nobody has to hear about. So I think that I'm, I think that my inhibitions have kind of fallen a little bit. So yeah. And I think it's just like, I mean, one, I don't have a very large audience either. Like, it's not yeah. going to be a huge, like, oh, my God, making front page of the New Yorker or anything. Maybe one I day mean, we'll get there. Good, yeah. so. Maybe one day we'll get there, Sarah. But <laughs> it's not yet. I guess uh, what should we do to get us a I guess sexy have to do this. Video. We'd have to no. do like the full uh, once we do this huge, like eight, ten part sexton, and then people will be like, oh, you should listen to this. Maybe. I don't know. Never well, been included I'm in that. that. I do want to look then as to how many because that we've gone through fairly, I guess, a bit of the first book. How much did she publish? So I'm looking at To Bedlam and Partway Back, All My Pretty Ones, Live or Die, Love Poems, Transformations, Book of Folly, Death Notebooks, Awful Roaring Towards God, and then Posthumously Published and Words for Dr. Wise. So you know what? We have a good nine episodes together. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm happy to do. I think that we're really the working also with this, with the kind of situating of it and the meat of it. So I think that it makes sense that this has been longer. That, and I think it's just like, I like, I mean, podcasting is like kind of a long form. Like whenever you see these kind of like, oh, it's only 45 minutes or like, you know, the New Yorker podcasts are always like 20 minutes or something. The Poetry Foundation podcast, they like read a poem and talk about it for 10 minutes or something. It's like, yeah, well, that's not really the format. That's like NPR format. That's like National Public Radio yeah. format. Like the podcasting format is like endless sprawling, like every random idea and thought and tangent and like. Yeah. And I think that also tangents are such an important part for learning in themselves. And I think that like, for example, I think our tangent on Doja Cat and girls and all of that, I think has been as important to our understanding of sex to the point that we could get to the place where we're able to kind of talk about the expatriates and do that. Exactly, so I, think yeah. I really fuck with like podcasting as a kind of form and why it's been really, really fun. Plus, like I always wanted this podcast to be like, um, just like what you would talk about, like post class. So like you have your class that lasts like an hour, hour and a half, three hours, whatever, if you're in a graduate school class. And it's like, then you go out after and then you like say what you really think and kind of the tangents and all the things that you like didn't want to bring up to like derail the whole class. And it's like, yeah, that's the fun part. Like that's the really fun part about this kind of stuff, especially talking about books. Yeah, like, absolutely. And I think that also because I think that in class, everybody has their kind of niceties. 
But I think right. that like being able to, I don't know. I think that it's kind of funny when you said you were kind of a guest on the other podcast and I think that you were kind of, you could tell the sort of nerviness around what you might say. I think that most people say these things when they're alone about those books anyway. And I think right. there is something in itself, perhaps to take it back, it's not, it's the kind of shamelessness. It's not, we're not being confessional and having our, and having our sort of own beliefs is a sort of shamelessness to kind of make a clean slate of it and say what we kind of believe about these things, which I think is perhaps um, interesting. Yeah. And there was the moss of his skin on page 26 was one that oh like, I probably so wouldn't funny. have, I probably wouldn't have noticed it, but like, since I have like a daughter coming, I've been so weepy about things like that. Like recently, like any type of movie scene or anything that I see with that, it's just always like, I was just wrote in my notes. I was like, man, did this hit different than when I read it? Like in my twenties, uh, <laughs> like this kind of, I think that I wrote on this poem when I was 19. So I guess 10 years ago. And I think that I have, as you can, I guess, see here, a very badly done meter. I like it. A bit, where I've kind of tried to do the meter. Because I think that it's almost quite childlike and depressing. It's really, really beautiful. And I think that I was kind of, I was wondering if you would bring this one up. But I think that I love, again, like when you're talking about with the poet, said the poet to the analyst, where she's like, they're like coins, they're like bees. There's the black room took us like a cave or a mouth or an indoor belly. There's this sort of weird idea of what are what are we going to decide upon to be the simile there? And I think that it's very claustrophobic. I think especially this is this kind of like weird image of like, yeah, my sisters will never know that I fall out of myself and pretend that Allah will not see how I hold my daddy like an old stone tree. I think there's something really terrifying about that. Yeah. Whereas actually, like, I think I feel this claustrophobia, but I think that this like old stone tree as an image is very weird. And I think that the way in which he kind of constructs this rhyme, and I think that each, um, so I think that I guess if I'm looking at my notes, each line pretty much has kind of two to three kind of stresses in it. And I think that it's sort of, that makes it seem almost kind of quite childlike and tentative, where it's like, you're actually like, I think that there's something almost very weirdly regressive about her tone here. That, and I mean, like, yeah, like the kind of epigraph that starts it, right? Like the kind of young girls in old Arabia were often buried alive yeah. next to their dead fathers, apparently as a sacrifice to the goddesses of the tribes. And it's kind of like, I don't know, I guess I've been thinking more about it again, like pending, like my daughter being born. It's like this kind of, I don't know. I mean, like I said, I've just been really weepy and emotional about those types of things recently. Like, even if it's like a dumb fucking movie, if there's like a scene with it or something, I'm just like, oh my God. Like, kind of. It's interesting. When is her due date? Um, September, September 22nd. Okay. Yeah. It's actually, the day that's... after my birthday, too. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Do you share a birthday with anybody cool? Uh, Bill Murray. I share a birthday with Bill Murray. I have to say this only to be a dick. I share a birthday with Sylvia Plath. Nice, yeah. And um, and Dylan Thomas, which is good. My and wife Sexton. actually shares a birthday with uh, Sexton. Yeah. November 9th. Yeah. See, this is why I enjoy this podcast because in any other society, knowing that Sexton's birthday is November 9th, I really do feel like the autistic kid who like <laughs> is never been able to, like I, who's never been able to talk about like I don't know like the public transport in Vienna and suddenly gets an opportunity to do it because I'm like it's like I've I've not like there's no reason for me to know this it's not like I'm doing my PhD on this right. I guess I just clearly really fuck with it a lot <laughs> so which is why it's actually really fun to kind of go into go into it with you and I think realize kind of yeah like analyze that. And it's just, I think it's like, it's creating a record. So now that like we've had this, I mean, everything is recorded now with social media, but now it's a record of us talking about this in a way that you're probably not going to hear anywhere else. You know, like you're probably not going to hear these things from other people talking about this, or it's not going to be as, you know, whatever, autistic and like schizophrenic as they would say online, but it's still like, that's creating like a different, like an alternative way to view and enjoy and appreciate these types of work from Sax somebody like Saxton. Because, you know, the world doesn't need another academic paper on Saxton. I'm sure there'll still be plenty of them written, but <laughs> like. It's so interesting because I do wonder when I read this about whether, I guess, like, this is a very interesting, just like when it says, and pretend that Allah will not see. I think that, um, 
what what would her exposure to Islam even have been? I think that like what would she have known any Muslims? I think that London is incredibly multicultural, so I have a lot of Muslim friends, and I live right by Edgware Road, which is a very famous sort of road for having kind of like with a huge Arabic diaspora. So I think that I see them all the time, and I think that I get loads of I I eat out there all the time, and I right. walk there to like do things. I think that it's kind of interesting. Like I wonder. I don't know how much this sort of where like yeah where like where is this sort of what like how yeah how is her really like is she coming at this solely from this kind of psychoanalytic journal that she read has she kind of like i think that it's only because in that the phrase that allah is used in the same way that christians would use the phrase god right which seems to me very different than how most muslims i know would use the phrase allah i don't think that they would say that i pretend that allah would not see and i wonder I if it's that, like I uh, guess her obsession with like the grim fairy tales and stuff. I wonder if it's like her um, exposure to it, especially because I guess, yeah, like you talk about like London and even most of the American cities here are that way. Yeah, like very much like there's much. But that's like a post 1970s yeah. thing. You well, know? That's, that's exactly what I'm thinking, which is I think that she was really working in like white suburbia in Boston. Or I think like, yeah, so I think her exposure would be like the 1001 Arabian Nights, like in that kind of fairy tale yeah, exactly. kind of ways. But who knows? I, I mean, her, she was wealthy, really, right? Like, wasn't her family wealthy? Well, so her family was kind of, I think that K.O., her husband's family was wealthy, okay, but they yeah. hated her. I think that my favorite story about her in terms of when she won the Pulitzer money, I think that she, everybody else, like, did, like, went on. She bought a, like, freestanding pool for her backyard. <sighs> And I think that she bought a pool and I think that that was the sort of scene at the time is a very crass thing to do. <laughs> that's an incredibly endearing thing to have done. So I think that she did have some kind of, she was not at all working class, but I think that she had some kind of class anxieties against a sort of literate, like, again, she wasn't a Boston Brahmin, like right. Lowell. So obviously, like, Lowell in himself was kind of seen as interesting <clears throat> because of that. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. I love that. I do have a kind of an obsession with above ground pools. Like, uh, really? Well, like, I just kind of, I like, uh, one of my first bands was called that, like, above ground pools. And it was just really? kind of. I should show you, you know what? I have loads. I can send you. So after this, because I think that sadly, I will actually have to go because I'm shocked it's like 10 30. Yeah, so, so sorry. Yeah. No, but don't apologize. I think this is the most fun thing ever. I think that, um, there's I want to one send you the video send you her music where she does Please. music back to me and some of her poems set to kind of guitar, which I think is really interesting. But I think that there's all these photos of her. She had two Dalmatians and then it's her and these two fucking huge Dalmatians in front of this above ground pool <laughs> that she got with her few lips her money. And I think that that's kind of hilarious to me. Absolutely. Yeah. Kind of really, really endearing. There's something about those types of dogs too, where it's kind of like those type of the Dalmatian, yeah, the yeah, kind yeah. of um, uh, what am I thinking? Uh, the Weimaraner, the kind of like mischievous kind of like dogs that are like very graceful and like beautiful looking, like to just have them like in these kind of like. There's always kind of photos throughout history of like the people with like their graceful, very kind of mischievous type yeah, breeds. Yeah, absolutely. Like. Um, yeah, I love that. Love that. I always say that that picture of Edith Wharton with like the two dog, the two little ones. Oh my god, like, I know exactly like, what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and she's like all in that fancy dress and coat, like the petticoat and frock or whatever. <laughs> like, and I like well, you have a dog on your shirt today. Yeah. I think that poets. I mean, I'm very much a dog poet rather than a cat poet. Same, yeah. Cats I think are... that, which is the only way to be. Yeah, cats suck. Yeah, I think that's the only way to be. I think that. Um, the cult of cats is being seen as kind of intellectual is um i don't know there's you know what if it, <laughs> there's some kind of intellectual argument i can construct around it but it would all be retarded oh yeah so, absolutely it would all be yeah. like I, i've been online too much but no i completely agree <laughs> yeah absolutely and it looks a lot like my dog as well that's why i have it really? yeah Oh, so cute. Do you have a dog? What's his name? Uh, Clover is the name. And she's she's eight. And she uh, she's kind of chubby now. But when she was a puppy, she very much looked like that because she's mostly Chihuahua, but she's like a total mutt, like mixed with like a bunch of other things. 
but uh, she has like kind of a chihuahua head and face looking, but then her body's a little bit bigger. She's like 15 pounds. She's bigger than like your average. Yeah, my dog, she recently, so me and my family were away for I think only a week, but my dog went to stay somewhere else. So I think I will like, I live in London. I'm 10 minutes away from my mom, mom and dad. So she's essentially my dog too. Right. But that my dog stress eats. She's very anxious. So she came back from this like kennel, like so fat. <laughs> And I don't know how she did that. And I think that they were like, she was very emotional. She's a very sensitive dog. And they were like, yeah, sorry, she was emotional eating and we couldn't stop her. My mom was like, my mom, it's so funny because my mom was trying to be sensitive where she's, she whispers it to me where she's like, we don't want to fat shame the dog. (laughs) She's like, in her mind, she's like, the dog can hear us. She's like, I don't want her to feel body shamed because we love her at any size. Yet we're doing this diet, so don't give her treats. And I'm like, okay, but like, we don't need to whisper, do we? And she's like, no, she can understand. Right. Yeah. And I kind of believe it. I go for that sort of shit. So. They embody the souls. Yeah. The soul of the dog. Well, so should we meet in a few weeks to talk about the next book? Because we should, in that yeah. 30, I had no look i i kind of expected i'd spend four hours here with you because i think that we've had so much fun i have no idea how you're gonna cut this up will it be multiple episodes or are we gonna um i'd probably since we're gonna have like such long conversations about multiple parts of this i'm probably gonna keep it all as one but when i do this i usually like to just keep it as kind of like pure as possible for the conversation so i usually just like let it flow but i do cut up you know i cut out whatever is like lulls or like if we were like you know something we didn't want in there or whatever so i'll cut that but then usually i just let it flow for like this is the conversation we had about this like you know so yeah and i was thinking like i might since we're gonna be doing so many i might like paywall every other one because you know you gotta get that bag yeah, kind of like, but, but i'll get my, yeah. i'll get my sims it. it'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> i think exactly, i'll, I'll, yeah. I'll I'll hopefully figure out a way. This was so much fun, though, and I can't wait to talk about, I think, that live, um, the next collection, which is all, oh, man, all those pretty ones, is going to be a fucking banger of a chat because I think that's some of my favorite poems are in that one. Yeah, I love that we planned it, too, listeners. We planned to do, like, three or four books, and we only got through one in, like, four hours. I know. But, this, uh... this is what I feel, though. Honestly, I think that, like, this is perfect. So yeah. I think that we we'll do it in the future uh drop your handles for everybody out there drop your uh whatever you want people to follow or well, your book's going to be linked in the description and all that but yeah so my name is sarah fletcher thank you guys for listening you can follow me at at sarah f poetry on x or twitter.com sarah fletcher 27 is my instagram and my book plus ultra is out on Shirio publishing and you can find it there If you're interested in any inquiries, scandals, whatever, inquire with me. I'm pretty open. So (laughs) thank you guys for listening. I've had a lot of fun. Yeah, of course. And this has been another episode of Heavy Board. See you. Heavy. Board. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Board. Sweats and the day sweats, pal. Pal, I do.